a little louder gavel than usual given this, this exciting crowd here tonight. So welcome everybody. I am gonna call to order this, uh, the Perrysburg Schools Board of Education regular board meeting on this Monday, April 17th, 2023. Mr. Drewyer, we'll start with roll call, please. Mrs. Eubank. Here. Ms. Larimer. Here. Mr. Pullman. Here. Dr. Rufford. Here. Mr. Bennington. Here. I ask we start with the Pledge of Allegiance. United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. all right, I'm going to open the meeting with our safety briefing. Perrysburg Schools welcomes you to the Commodore Building, and we thank you for attending tonight's Board of Education meeting. We care about the safety of our students, staff, families, and guests. Please note there are exits on both the east and west sides of the cafeteria. In case of an emergency, an AED is located just outside the cafeteria doors. You are located at 140 East Indiana Avenue. Thank you for joining us tonight and supporting Perrysburg Schools. So next item on the agenda, uh, next item is to adopt the proposed agenda. So I'm looking for a motion to accept Move. the agenda. Mr. Pullman. Second. Ms. Eubank, Mrs. Eubank, and roll call, please. Mr. Pullman. Yes. Mrs. Eubank. Yes. Dr. Reffert. Yes. Ms. Larimer. Yes. Mr. Bennington. Yes. There will be, with the, uh, with the agenda adopted, there will be two opportunities for um, public participation tonight. Anybody wishing to participate, we ask that you sign up at the sign-up sheet in the back prior to the start of our first public participation. So now onto the business. We've got, I've heard something over 80 students or so tonight to recognize as well, some good work on part of our administrators. So Mr. Hosser, I will turn the recognitions over to you. All right, thank you very much. Um, so we want to begin uh, this evening um, and we have a full agenda. So we appreciate everybody coming out and um, we will take a break following the recognitions because I know there are many students and, and uh, that want to get back to start on their homework right away, so <laughs> we'll keep that in mind. But uh, for, first off, we have some folks from the Auditor of State who are here to present an award, and um, I'll turn it over to Mr. Drewyer if, they, if you see them. Good evening. Um, thank you for having me this evening. My name is Lori Brody, and it is my honor to be here this evening on behalf of State Auditor Keith Faber. And I am here this evening to recognize the Perrysburg School System with the Auditor of State Award. But I'd like to take a minute just to tell you what the award means and let you know that it puts the school district in a very select group. We audit about 6,000 ent entities every year. We audit um, schools, cities, counties, villages, Anybody essentially who spends taxpayer dollars by law, they must receive an audit. So we do that, and you're one of the 6,000. But of all of the entities that receive awards, only about 8% are eligible for this award. So it does put you in a special group. And it's also presented to local governments and school districts when you complete the audit, and it's considered a clean audit report. And just a quick laundry list of all the things you have to do to get this award. First, you must file your financial report with the auditor state within 150 days of fiscal year end. To have a clean audit, you can have no findings for recovery, no material citations, no material weaknesses, significant deficiencies, single audit findings, or question costs, so just a short list there. You get a management letter, and your management letter can contain no comments related to ethics referrals, question costs less than 10,000, lack of timely report submission, reconciliation issues, failure to obtain your timely single audit, and any findings for recovery of less than $100. Also, there can be no public meeting or public records infractions. So you can see it's a really short list here we have, but I think it actually, um, especially in a school district, I think it represents like the hard work of everybody. A school is a little bit different than some cities um, and little villages. You have a lot of employees, so it takes everybody. I think each employee every day has to strive for that accounting excellence. But I like to come to the board meeting because I think it's important to recognize the superintendent and the school board because you guys have the hard work for spending each dollar accounting for every dollar as well. But I would be remiss if I didn't recognize the treasurer. So 
he is um, heading that effort up, and I think it's really important to recognize Randy, your treasurer, and the staff for the excellent job they do and commitment to fiscal integrity. So on behalf of Auditor Keith Faber, I'd like to present you with this award. This is a teamwork award, and it's not just a fiscal department. If James, I think I saw Denise, Kelly, Don, Christy, it's HR, Brent Schwartzmiller, and the grants. Um, anyone else from my department here? Let, why don't you come up here and we'll get a, a picture together? Because it's when the audit is not just a fiscal office, they're, they're auditing our grants, they're auditing food service, they're auditing transportation. HR plays a role in compliance. Schwartzmiller, come on. Denise, <laughs> Kelly. I love how the guys all call themselves by their last names. What do you want to say? It's so cute. I'm not going to stand next to him. I'll stand next to him. I'll stand next to him. Who is it from high school? Well, you just saw them. Pretend you like each other. Yeah. Oh, Kelly. Oh, Kelly. Thank you, Mrs. Brody, for coming tonight and presenting that and the kind words about Randy and his staff. And you know, Randy's been with us uh, a little longer than I think now, a couple, a year and a half, couple of years now. And it's uh, sitting on the finance committee. It's great to see how Randy operates uh, within the administration, within the community, the improvements he's done to the processes and the reporting, all while still minding the shop and making sure that the numbers are clean. So thank you again, Randy. Congratulations. Yes, absolutely. Okay, our next item, we have recognition of our spring musical cast. Yes, and, and let me begin by apologizing for the typo on the agenda. It says spring musical, so I don't know what was happening earlier today, but uh, with the weather, so <laughs> it is a spring musical. It's happening very soon, but, uh, um, but it, it, we'd like to uh, take a moment and, and ask uh, Mr. Cookson, uh, Perrysburg High School principal, to step up and talk about uh, the production that is taking place here very soon. And um, we have a few students that'll be here to help him with that. So, Mr. Cookson. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Um, board members, Mr. Drewyer, Mr. Hostler. Um, yeah, we're really, really excited about the upcoming uh, spring musical. Um, our students always put on an exceptional performance. And uh, if you've never been to one of our musicals, uh, please consider coming out uh, this, uh, uh, well, next week, uh, April 27th, 20th, 29th, and 30th. Uh, I'd like to highlight some of the uh, cast members uh, in, uh, in our musical, Into the Woods. Uh, and those three cast members, if you could come up right now that uh, are here with us. We have uh, 12th grader Clara Birkin, who is playing Cinderella's stepmother. And if I read uh, Wikipedia correctly, um, Into the Woods is basically a, uh, a combination of many different uh, fairy tales, correct? Okay, okay, but just behind it. Uh, also, we have uh, Josh Kennedy, uh, 11th grader, who is playing Jack uh, in Into the Woods. And uh, last but not least, we have 11th grader Mira Zarabinsky, who is playing Lucinda in into the woods. So uh, these kids work exceptionally hard uh, at what they do. They're there late nights, weekends, and they put a lot of time, effort, and energy into the production. And uh, you can tell when you go see one of our, our musicals. So uh, if you have not, uh, again, I would encourage you uh, to come out uh, next week. So uh, thank you three. Okay, thank you. Very good. Um, thanks. And, and next, um, we, we, had, we, we began a tradition here where we recognized um, state qualifiers. Um, a number of years ago, we thought it was such a, uh, a significant event for, for individuals who qualify at the state level in, in different types of competition to come before the board. And, um, and that's something that um, you know, we've continued to do. So I appreciate the board allowing us to, to shine a spotlight on this, but as you can see, 
um, we have uh, more and more students that are being able to achieve success at that state level, which is a good problem. In fact, we have to spread this out over uh, two, two months because of so many students. So tonight we're going to, to delve into some of these recognitions and we'll begin with the winter sports. And um, right now we have, um, we'll begin with um, cheerleading and I believe um, um, Jenna, Jenna Perry. It's over there. Okay, sorry, <laughs> Jenna, thanks. I should probably go with her. Hi, uh, I'm Jenna Perry. This is my first year as the head cheerleading coach at Perrysburg High School. A uh, quick overall summary um, of how our athletes did this year was first and second place at a lot of local competitions, um, but overall taking overall champion out of 27 teams at an Ohio competition in January, and then ending our year as the state runner up at the OASSA state competition. Um, these kids have worked super hard. Their season starts in August um, and doesn't conclude until the beginning of March. So with us we have Grayson Bella, Maya Combus, Morgan Douglas, Shauna Fredrickson is, I believe, at lacrosse, still working hard, uh, Kira Hartland, Grace Helton, Allison Hoffman, Addison Caulfield, Ariana Lawnison, Ava Lewis, Lexi Lorin, Trevor Madigan, Elena McNulty, Lainey Reese, Ashlyn Tice, Emma Thompson, Kennedy Wood, and then my assistant is Madison Nenendold. Thank you. Congratulations. Well done. Congratulations again yeah. to the cheerleading team. Awesome. Um, next uh, on the agenda for um, introductions is um, uh, Miss Sig, who is our head uh, swim coach. Thank you very much, Mr. Hostler. If you all would stand in a line, please, and when I call your name, you're gonna step forward. Trevor, welcome back. Um, okay. I made the mistake last year of wearing my white polo um, the same night that they did, and then you couldn't tell that I was there. So um, tonight I wore yellow and black so that you could see me. My name is Elena Sig. Uh, I am here tonight to offer the board and community, I am here tonight uh, and offer the board and community with your highest accomplished swim qualifying swimmers and divers um, of the 22-23 season. Here uh, in the crowd is assistant coach Kendall Karchner and uh, Amanda Monsheen, who she could not be here tonight. I'd like to extend a warm extension of appreciation from the athletic to the athletic boosters uh, administration and board for their support throughout the season. The 22-23 swim and dive athletes um, here tonight represented Perrysburg High School with a strong jacket pride presence and moved the bar for our entire team's expectations and individual goals to a whole new level. This year, the team of 30 athletes were led by captains Kyle O'Connell. If you could stand, Kyle, I know you're here. Thank you, sir. Um, Owen Recker, John Majerus, and Haley Gano, and Emma Erlenbush. Thank you. 
The team welcomed eight new freshmen Yellow Jackets and carried 12 returning sophomores and juniors. Graduating the program, there are eight swimmers and two divers. This year, our team of boys earned first in the NLL championship, and our girls placed second. They also took first and second overall in the Oak Harbor Invitational. Senior Owen Recker and freshman Trevor Madigan, please step forward, thank you, represented our Perrysburg boys diving team, placing first and second at the district meet, moving on to the state tournament. As a freshman, Trevor made the state podium, placing eighth in the state, and senior and All-American Owen Recker placed third, and again, during the season, several times, breaking team records from last year in the 11 dive competition with 552.65 points. The following swim athletes qualified for this year's state competition and during the season broke three new season team records. As I call your name, please step forward and stay there. Just pop up and back. Um, in the boys' 200 medley relay, you're going to come out here. <laughs> um, a record of one minute and 38.35 seconds was set by senior Stephen Green, junior Seth Merriman, senior John Majerus, and junior Ewan Fisher, and alternate senior Nick Niseski. This year, we had the most individuals qualify in events to compete. Senior Haley Gano swam the 200 individual medley with a time of two minutes and 9.76 seconds. <laughs> Senior Steve Green swam and set the new boys 50 yard freestyle with 21.94 seconds. And sophomore Natalie Sanders swam the girls' 200 freestyle, placing in the top 24 in the state. Natalie set a new record during the season with one minute and 53.35 seconds. The coaching team couldn't be prouder for their success, leadership, and representation of their teammates. Thank you. Congratulations again to the uh, individual and the team accomplishments. Really well done. Awesome. Well, keeping with the theme of uh, breaking records, I'd like to introduce uh, our head wrestling coach, Scott Burnett. Coach Burnett. Thank you guys very much. Um, so what we're going to do, um, I'm going to just go through these guys. Um, or no, I'll talk about the team stuff, and then we can just acknowledge the guys individually. Um, so first of all, thank you for allowing us to uh, be recognized. All the kids, adults that are getting recognized too, congrats to you guys. Perrysburg is a great place. Um, so, so our wrestling team, we were league champions this year sectional champions, um, district runner-ups, and then we, were, we finished second at state. Um, we finished 15th in the country, which um, I don't know if that's ever happened with our wrestling program, so that's really, really cool. Mm -hmm. um, and then out of our seniors, we got five kids that are going to um, continue their uh, um, academic and athletic career um, in Division One, which is, I mean, going to college is, pretty remarkable anyways, but being able to do that and compete and, and do that at the, at the highest level is pretty remarkable. Um
do now is starting right here at our little guy. Um, Aiden Dodd was our 106 pounder. He finished up at fifth place in the state. Alex Dinkins was our 113 pounder and he was a state alternate. Um, Marcus Blaze was our 120 pounder and he finished up as a state champion. Um, Ryan Avalos was our 126 pounder and he was a state champion. Diego Chavez um, was our 38 pounder. Uh, oh, actually, Cole Evans, who's not here, was um, a state. Um, Diego Chavez was our 138 pounder um, and he was a state qualifier. AJ Parrish was our 144 pounder and he finished up uh, six uh, in the state. Um, Winton Dinkins was our 150 pounder and he finished up third uh, in the state. Um, Jake Wood was our 57 pounder, 157 pounder and he finished up seventh. Uh, Joey Blaze was our 65 pounder and he was a state champion. Miles Tackett was our 175, and he was also a state champion. And our 190 pounder, Nick Hartzell, was a state alternate. Um, so, yeah, what's uh, what I'm super proud of um, is just these guys' perseverance. What we're trying to do in Division One in the closed enrollment uh, community, and and chase down St. Eds, Lakewood St. Eds. If you're unfamiliar, just research them. They've won 44 state championships. Um, they're really, really good. But um, I take my chances here at Perrysburg any day trying to beat them. So um, thank you uh, once again. Congratulations to these guys and everybody else. Thank you very much. Awesome. <laughs> just the kids. You just want kids in there? <laughs> Certainly uh, exceptional season, and, and last year we were very excited for the wrestling team and all their accomplishments being state runner-up, and, and this year they exceeded those expectations, and um, it's great to see, uh, see that success continue. Um, one of the neat things about being in, in Perrysburg is, is you know, we, we just had an opportunity to talk about some staff and what they do, uh, outstanding, the work that they do. We recognize the spring musical um, and, and what's happening here in the next couple weeks, which is something the whole community comes out for. Um, some of our uh, winter sports athletes. And now we're going to talk about um, some of our um, performing arts. And I'll ask, well, I'll say a few words. I'll ask those performing arts uh, folks to, to step up. And while they make their way there, um, that high expectation that we have in the classroom and in the athletic arena also applies to the performing arts and, and we're certainly excited about some of the things that have happened uh, this year. So with that, um, we'll turn it over to... All right, so if all of our musicians come up here to the front. <laughs> So um, my name is Abby Miles. I'm one of the orchestra directors at Perrysburg High School. Um, the high school music department is super proud to recognize all of these musicians that are standing over here for their achievement in participating in the Onye All-State Band, Choir, and Orchestra. Back in May of 2022, these students underwent an audition process to be admitted into these all-state ensembles. In order to be accepted, these students have to demonstrate some of the highest levels of musicianship and skill to be considered for this high achievement for a high school musician. In February of 2023, these students went to Columbus, Ohio and had many hours of rehearsal with some of the nation's leading conductors, as well as performed alongside many of the best student musicians in all of Ohio at the OMEA Music Educator Conference. Also, to top it off in front of hundreds and hundreds of music teachers. <laughs> <laughs> 
So on behalf of the music department, Mr. Burns, Mr. Schleter, and myself would like to recognize and congratulate these musicians. So when we say your name, just step on forward. So first we have Johnny Widener, and Patrick Chen, Julia G, and Sam Zackel. And our wind instrumentalists uh, that was also selected for Allstate Orchestra as Ryan Matthews, and for Allstate Band, John Majerus. And for Allstate Choir, we have Evan Boyers, a senior. We have Callie Dunphy, a junior. Jake Graffiti, a senior. Ella Ibsen, who could not be here tonight because she is at Into the Woods rehearsal, um, <laughs> sophomore. And lastly, Kenzie Morris, senior. So congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations again to this group of talented musicians. Thank you very much. Um, certainly the, the group will be recognizing next. Um, there is a certain artistic flair to what they do, but at this time I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Mrs. Kemp, our uh, speech and debate, uh, I guess, coach. Hey, good evening. Uh, my name is Deborah Kemp, and I've been the head coach for the Perrysburg Speech and Debate Team for 17 seasons now. Uh, propping me up here today is my dedicated and multi-talented assistant, uh, Jen Lake. Um, I <laughs> there you, go. you can step out and say. Um, I, speak on I speak on behalf of our entire team and coaching staff when I say thank you for the recognition and continuing support of this team. Uh, this year, we rostered 22 students who competed during our scheduled 11 tournaments, two sets of districts, states, and nationals this June. Although this has been a rebuilding year, we had much to be proud about. We have, for starters, we hosted our first tournament in three years and had nearly 300 students traveling from as far away as Dayton and Columbus to compete. Uh, in February, the National Speech and Debate Association presented the team with the Leading Chapter Award and national recognition for the excellence in the speech and debate, uh, speech and debate for the years between 2005 and 2000, <laughs> uh, excuse me, 2022. Also, we are incredibly honored over the years. I'm kind of like, this is kind of like a, um, I'm uh, letting the cat out of the bag here. We're incredibly honored over the years, uh, over the years to have both, uh, to have the valedictorian or the salutatorian, salutatorian on our team. However, this year we have both of them. <laughs> so we're pretty excited about that. Um, okay. Um, so unfortunately we have some, some conflicts, so we have some uh, students missing. Our students are very busy. Uh, however, this year we have qualified 12 students and two alternates to the state tournament. Among those 12 that qualified were four four-time state qualifiers, which is, we're not going to do that for another few years. So um, we have James Chow, 
who is at practice tonight, Max Baca, who is at Into the Woods, uh, Nikhil Methy, and Andy Chung. Uh, Andy advanced to the final round of states and international extemporaneous speaking for the second time in his career. Um, I was especially excited because the first time he did it was virtual, and he, at that point, was the youngest um, uh, student that we ever had uh, advanced to finals. And so this year, he actually got to be physically on the stage uh, at state, so it was pretty exciting. Um, and then, then for uh, Nikhil, advanced to semifinals and declamation. So Max Baca advanced to quarterfinals and dramatic interpretation, and also Max will be representing Western Ohio and Perrysburg at Nationals this June. Awesome. So uh, this is the rest, so I, how should we do this? I guess I should say who else is here, because uh, so this is Tom Van Camp. If you step up. Okay. <laughs> Tanisha Dakwa. Andy Chung, which we already saw. Uh, and Nikhil. This is uh, Gia Thacker. And her part, are we, no, we've already gone down here, but there's no mind. Uh, our debater. Um, um, so he won't bring it. Oh, it says, I got to take my glasses off now, so he won't bring it. Ella, nice. Ella and Khan, <laughs> Lydia uh, Williams, uh, Nithya Dryden, I don't ever say their last name, and uh, Amana Alam. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Kelly. I should listen to my own coaching sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> you exempt it still, didn't you? I kind of exempt it still, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I had it written down. I have, should I let? For size and like her weight, <laughs> I'll be I'll be on the end. <laughs> that is really impressive for what I think you called the rebuilding year. So many more years to come. Congratulations, awesome. guys! Well done. Congratulations. So next, uh, I'd like to, to welcome back Mr. Cookson to the um, podium. All right, um, two very special uh, introductions here for the gentleman uh, behind me. Um, first of all, I just want to say how impressed I am with them uh, and everything that they do. I swear, probably neither one of them sleeps. Uh, if they do, it's maybe an hour or two, maybe a night. Uh, and you'll, you'll hear why here uh, in a second. But uh, behind me, um, closest to me, uh, Andrew Chung, is, as you already heard, uh, he is our valedictorian for the class of 2023. And uh, Nikhil Methy is our salutatorian for the class of 2023. Uh, and we've already started to dive I've been a little bit to graduation speeches and getting to know these guys even better than I, I did before. But I'm just truly impressed with uh, you know everything that they do uh, inside and outside of the classroom, and just uh, how much they challenge themselves and how much they succeed at everything that they do. It's, they're they're two amazing uh, young men. So uh, talking about Andrew uh, first, some of the things that he uh, either is currently in or uh, has been uh, participating in during his time at PHS. Um, he's a national merit finalist to start, uh, which is a, a huge honor. Uh, he's in the Asian American Club, uh, Book Club, Speech and Debate, uh, as you just heard, Pep Band, Orchestra, uh, NHS, uh, as, well as, as well as Mock Trial. So a uh, very uh, well-rounded student, uh, obviously very intelligent, hardworking, and very personable as well. So uh, I want to congratulate Andrew Chung.
And it's really fun working with them because they're almost like a, the younger folks won't remember uh, this duo, uh, you know, uh, way back when, but they're kind of like a, and I mean this in a positive way, um, like a Laurel and Hardy. They just, they play off each other really, really well. They have fun with one another. They seem like they really like each other and enjoy each other's company. And, you know, they're probably together most days, most hours of those days. So <laughs> that probably explains some of it. Um, Nikhil is our, our salutatorian for the class of 2023. Um, he, as well as, as Andrew, is involved in many, many things and does so very, very successfully. Uh, National Merit Scholar as well. Uh, he's involved in tennis, uh, Asian American Club, uh, Book Club, Interact Club, Speech and Debate. Uh, robotics is a big passion of his, Pride Club, Pep Band, uh, Orchestra, NHS, uh, Link Crew, Key Club. So just to name many of the, uh, the opportunities we have at PHS for students, I just named probably about three quarters of them and these guys are involved in, in them. So I wanna congratulate Nikhil too on his uh, wonderful accomplishment and I really look forward to continuing working toward graduation with both these guys coming up on May 21st. So congratulations, Nikhil. Congratulations. Congratulations again. We look forward to seeing you up on stage in a, in a month's time here. Congratulations again. The next two agenda items, uh, Mr. Mr. Buecher, I'm not sure if you want to, to, to come up, but they're both junior high um, um, uh, groups that have been uh, state qualifiers, and not sure if you wanted to. All right. Good evening, I'm Mr. Zwyer. I am an eighth grade teacher at the junior high and I was also the math counts coach this year for these three individuals. Um, we had Simon Dang, who is not present this evening, um, Zach Meyer, Lisa Krasikova, and Angela Choi. Um, math counts is a competition that they meet voluntarily after school at least once a week and they focus on very challenging math problems with and without a calculator. I took our top 10 individuals to the local competition at the University of Toledo, and these three with Simon Dang competed as a team and for place first place out of the nine schools that competed at the Toledo chapter. So they qualified for the state competition. We went to Columbus in March, um, where these three placed seventh overall for the state, and then Simon Dang placed fourth individually out of the 162 people who are competing at states. So he also qualified for the national competition in May in Orlando, Florida, Disney World. So I'm very proud of these individuals. Very proud of them, and we wish them success in their future, and Simon, luck in May when he goes to Orlando. Thank you. Congratulations. Oh, all right. <laughs> That's awesome. Well done, well deserved. Thank you very much and congratulations. So next up is uh, another junior high group that uh, had uh, some state qualifiers, and uh, that's Power of the Pen. And uh, Ms. Sher. If my Power of the Pen friends could join me up here, please. So I am Jen Share. I am one of the Power of the Pen advisors at the junior high. I also coach with Jamie Avery. And we have the pleasure of introducing some students who love to write to you tonight. So if you're not familiar with Power of the Pen, it is a creative writing team. And so in the fall, the students tried out for the team. And then in February, we began competitions. And just to kind of help you understand what a competition looks like, and also to help us really appreciate how talented they are, at the competitions, there are three rounds of writing. And the judge will reveal the prompt at the beginning of the round, and then they have 40 minutes to write a complete story, and when the timer goes off, they must drop 
their pen. And so they repeat that three times, so at the end their hands are a little bit tired and they're slightly exhausted, but they are very good at what they do. At the district competition, the seventh and eighth grade teams brought home some nice first place plaques. And then on the seventh grade side, Mona Gill placed third. The eighth grade side was a little more dramatic. We had two students tie for first place. <laughs> and it came down to a tiebreaker. And after the tiebreaker, Alex Ban was first, and Rhea did not roll her eyes there. She <laughs> placed second. Um, these three students also received recognition for best of round. So one of their po stories received best of round recognition, and then Alex Ban received the Platinum Pen Award. So it is as fancy as it sounds. He has written a story called Proud, and mind you, he wrote it in 40 minutes, and it's going to be published in the Power of the Pen Book of Winners at the end of the season. So these competitors, along with others, qualified for the regional tournament, so that was in March. And at the regional tournament, it's kind of cool because they do a seventh and eighth grade combined team score. And at the end of the award ceremony, our seventh and eighth grade teams won, and we got to walk home with a giant trophy and place it on Mr. Buker's desk when we got to school Monday morning, so that was kind of neat. And then our friends up here are uh, headed to the state tournament, which is a really big deal. Less than 25% of the writers at the regional tournament qualify, and we even had two of them place. So eighth graders, um, Alex Band placed fourth, and Rhea placed second at the regional tournament. And then all five of them will be headed to the state competition on May 19th at Ashland University. So I'm just gonna say your name if you wanna wave, take a bow, do a dance, you pick. Um, <laughs> we've got Mona Gill, seventh grader, Myla Dawson, Rhea Katri, 8th grade, Manya Parikh, 8th grade, and Alex Spann. Thank you. Congratulations and good luck to those going to state. So well done, folks. All right. Um, next is, is something that I know is a very special um, uh, agenda item for, for our staff and administrative team and, and uh, for, for the board. Um, in Ohio, um, uh, teachers are uh, able to ask for uh, consideration for a continuing contract. Um, and, and that is something that um, there's requirements that the state has set to be eligible to ask. And, um, and then um, Perrysburg has certainly a very high standard in terms of the process that we use to grant continuing contracts. So this is um, the list of those uh, teachers that will be appearing later on in the agenda to be uh, considered for continuing contracts. Um, we, we began this tradition here because of the event and what it means is to ask those teachers to come, um, the principals that, that they work with, uh, say a few words and introduce uh, those uh, teachers uh, to the board and to the community. Um, it's a significant commitment on the board's part and certainly um, a, um, an important uh, achievement based on those those staff members. So, so with that, um, we'll begin with um, Perrysburg High School, and I'll ask Mr. Cookson to to step up first with his uh, uh, recommendations. All right, we have uh, four outstanding educators uh, who I will be speaking about uh, this evening briefly. Um, I'll do this in alphabetical order by last name, so if you guys wanna put yourselves in alphabetical order, that'll be your first test to see if I do actually read your name or not. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> um, 
All right, first here to my, my left is uh, Aaron Gallagher, and it's my honor to recommend uh, Aaron for a continuing contract. Uh, Aaron has been teaching for eight years, all of which have taken place in Perrysburg uh, at the high school, as she can't imagine being anywhere else. Uh, prior to teaching, Mrs. Gallagher served four years active duty uh, in the United States Army as a logistics officer as well. Uh, she earned her undergraduate degree from Miami University, where she double majored in international studies and political science with a minor in French. Uh, additionally, Mrs. Gallagher holds a master's of education degree from the University of Finley. Uh, Aaron currently teaches or has taught in previous years at PHS the following courses, psychology, uh, United States government, sociology, and world history. Uh, Mrs. Gallagher also supports PHS students by serving as National Honor Society Advisor, Link Crew Coordinator, Gender, Sexuality, and Allies Club Advisor, uh, and serves on the, uh, on the SWAT team at Perrysburg High School, which stands for Staff Working Against Trouble. I will clarify. <laughs> It's a good thing. It's a good thing. Uh, furthermore, uh, last uh, school year, Mrs. Gallagher's colleagues chose her as Perrysburg High School's Perrysburg Schools Foundation Teacher of the Year. Uh, when I asked Erin what her favorite aspect of being a teacher is, she commented, in no other profession can one uh, get the human experience that is attained from teaching high school students. They are larger than life and even more complex than the subjects we teach. The capacity for human connectedness appears daily in diverse and wonderful ways. Even on days when our shared struggles outweigh success, I cannot imagine any other journey as deeply rewarding as teaching. Erin has an uncanny ability to reach all of her students. She is a favorite among the student body because she makes them feel welcome, safe, and excited to learn. So for the reasons outlined above, I recommend uh, Mrs. Erin Gallagher receive strong consideration for a continuing contract. Next, we have Mr. Tim Kitson, best dressed guy, no offense, best dressed guy here tonight. <laughs> um, <laughs> I am honored to recommend Tim Kitson for a continuing contract. This, this year marks his 12th, uh, 12th year in the field of education. Uh, all 12 of Tim, Tim's years as a teacher have taken place at Perrysburg High School. Tim earned a Bachelor's of Arts degree in English from Michigan State University and a Master's of Education in Classroom Technology from Bowling Green State University. Uh, and Tim can attest to this, anytime I need anything tech-wise, I am knocking at his door, texting him, calling him, etc. He is a wizard uh, with technology. Uh, he teaches English 312, Technical Writing and Media Literacy, uh, this year at PHS. In the past, Mr. Kitson has also taught English 210, 211, and 311. Tim currently serves as a mentor teacher and is a member of the district's Technology Advisory Committee. Previously, Mr. Kitson served on the building's SWAT team, faculty advisory committee, and as a member of the faculty council for National Honor Society. Tim's favorite part about teaching is helping students recognize and reach their full potential. Mr. Kitson believes that most students are capable of much, much more than they realize. Tim stated, with the right tools and the right guidance, they can achieve amazing results. Mr. Kitson added, I'm grateful to all the people who have helped me become the educator I am. There are too many to name, but they know who they are. Go Jackets. Tim truly believes that every student has the ability to learn, grow, and succeed. He supports his students by creating a positive learning environment filled with encouragement and care. And Mr. Kitson shares strong, positive rapport with his students and goes above and beyond to make sure all students feel validated, heard, and supported. For the reasons outlined above, I highly recommend Mr. Tim Kitson receive strong consideration for continuing contract as well. Next, we have uh, Christy Moravitz. Um, it's my pleasure to recommend Christy Moravitz for a continuing contract. Christy is in her ninth year as a teacher, uh, with all nine taking place in Perrysburg. See a common uh, theme there. Christy earned a bachelor's in chemistry while minoring in mathematics from Michigan State University in 2013. She earned her master's in curriculum and instruction in mathematics from the University of Texas, Arlington in 2020. Christy currently teaches Geometry and Algebra 2 at PHS, but has also taught Algebra 1 and Math Intervention. Uh, additionally, Mrs. Moravitz currently serves on the Curricular Review Mathematics team for PHS uh, and is also the team leader for both the Geometry and Algebra 2 uh, teams. 
Throughout her tenure at the high school, Christy has also been an advisor of the PHS GSA, uh, a STUCO advisor, student council advisor for the class of 2022, and both a member and leader of the PHS SWAT team. When asked what her uh, favorite part of being a teacher is, she responded with the following. Most of the work I have contributed to the district uh, has been in the classroom. I have redesigned and aligned our course materials to the standards and designed the curriculum so our students can meet high expectations and are well prepared for life after high school. However, my favorite part of teaching is building relationships with students. Math is something that oftentimes people have been told they are either good or bad at. My favorite moments are when students who believe they are bad at math find success and feel more confident. Part of uh, building confidence is building a connection with students, and that is where I find the most joy in my role as an educator. It's evident that Christy believes uh, or prides herself on creating and fostering positive relationships with her students. In addition, Christy works hard to ensure students are ready for their next steps, both academically and in life. For the reasons outlined above, I highly, highly recommend Mrs. Christy Moravitz receive strong consideration for a continuing contract. Okay, we have Heather Westrick uh, to the far uh, right, here, right, my left, uh, and I also, uh, it's my pleasure to recommend her for a continuing contract as well. Heather has been teaching for 19 years, five of which have taken place uh, in Perrysburg. Previous to teaching at PHS, Mrs. Westrick taught at Tippecanoe High School for 12 and a half years and Anthony Wayne High School for a year and a half. Heather holds a bachelor's and master's of education degree from Wright State University. Mrs. Westrick has taught American government history and sociology. In addition to her exceptional work in the classroom, Heather serves as an assistant advisor of student council, co-advisor for National Honor Society, co-advisor for GSA Club, and is the advisor of Women's Empowerment Club. When I asked Heather what her favorite aspect of being an educator is, she responded with the following. My favorite thing about teaching is getting to know the students. Uh, their passions, personalities, and quirks are all the highlight of my job. I work hard to create a family-like atmosphere in each of my class periods so students feel comfortable uh, enough to be themselves and to share their views and ideas. Also, being a parent of Perrysburg kids myself and being able to attend sporting events, student council activities, etc., with my own kids to watch my students excel is such an honor. Heather has a true passion for her students, their well-being, and achievement. She works diligently to ensure all of her students' educational and social-emotional social needs are met. Therefore, her students genuinely appreciate her as their teacher and mentor. So for the reasons outlined above, I highly recommend Mrs. Heather Westrick receive strong consideration for a continuing contract. So anyway, I just want to uh, um, just say again, uh, four uh, fabulous teachers uh, here to my left, um, and they work very, very hard to meet the needs of our students um, and do so uh, in the right way. So um, congratulations to each of, of you four. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we'll invite Mr. Bucher up uh, for his uh, recommendations. All right. Good evening once again, and, and thank you so much for the opportunity to present three of PJHS's finest teachers here. I'm also going to do it alphabetically. It's not as challenging as four, but still three may be a little bit of a challenge here. So I'll start with, um, we're going to do a reverse order apparently, so it's, no, we're good. Um, so the first one I'm going to introduce is, is Kathleen Schneer. Um, so I am privileged to recommend Ms. Kathleen Schneer to you for a continuing con contract with Perrysburg Schools. Ms. Schneer began her teaching career in 2015 and has spent her entire career as a Yellow Jacket serving the district at all three levels in education in teaching orchestra. Ms. Schneer earned her bachelor's degree in music education from Bowling Green State University and then her master's degree in music ed from the University of Michigan in 2020. Ms. Schneer's accolades certainly speak for themselves, earning the new Teacher of the Year Award by the Ohio Strain Teacher Association in 2020, 
was a featured author for a publication motivating orchestra students during the pandemic in the February 2021 issue of the American Strain Teacher Journal and a feature presenter at the Michigan Music Conference and the upcoming American Strain Teacher Association National Conference for her research titled Understanding Students' Needs, a Guide for Action in the Orchestra Classroom. Professionally, Ms. Schneer is an active member of the Ohio Music Education Association, serving as the District 1 Junior High Honors Orchestra Chair, a member of the American Strain Teacher Association and the Suzuki Association of Americas. In addition to that work, Ms. Schneer has been a mentor teacher for the American Strain Teacher Association and for Bowling Green State University. As one of our orchestra directors, Ms. Schneer has approximately 200 students accepted to the Ohio Music Education Association District 1 Honor Orchestra since her hiring. Ms. Schneer's students have been featured performers at events such as the Ohio Musical Education Association Professional Development Conference in Cincinnati, the Perrysburg Symphony Orchestra, and performers of the National Anthem at both the Toledo Mudhands and the Toledo Walleye Games. Under Ms. Schneer's guidance, the Perrysburg Orchestra has received multiple superior ratings at OMEA, State Orchestra, and Solo Ensemble adjudicated events. Ms. Schneer is also currently serving the district and assisting in further developing the scope of Perrysburg's music education, serving on the grades 5 through 12 curriculum review committee. At the junior high, we speak a lot about modeling our loves and our passions. Ms. Schneer certainly does this with her involvement of strains in her own life. In addition to items already mentioned, Ms. Schneer is the, con is the conductor of the Toledo Symphony Youth Orchestra, a member of the Perrysburg Symphony Orchestra, an instructor at the Toledo Symphony, Symphony School of Music, which my daughter takes violin lessons at, and a member of the band Freight Street, and has even performed with the Trans-Siberian Orchestra. It is truly an honor to recommend Kathleen for a con continuing contract with Perrysburg Schools. So next, it is also a privilege to recommend Mrs. Carrie Stutes to you for a continuing contract with Perrysburg Schools. Mrs. Stutes has been with Perrysburg since her student teaching in 2009, and we are fortunate that she chose to stay on as a jacket for her teaching career, as she has been an influential instructional leader for us at the junior high ever since. While at PJHS, Mrs. Stutes has served students in grades 7 and 8 ELA and math. The last 10 years, she has been a core member of our fantastic eighth grade ELA team and has taken on team teaching the two most recent years, collaborating with an intervention specialist to meet the needs of our diverse learners. Mrs. Stutes has welcomed the most recent change and has thrived with her team teaching partner. At the heart of Mrs. Stutes is a passion for being a lifelong learner and sharing that with her students. In 2012, Mrs. Stutes earned her master's degree in curriculum from BGSU and has used that knowledge to help serve the district previously as a JEDI technology member, a member of the ELA curriculum review, a member of our building and district leadership teams. Currently, Mrs. Stutes serves on our district wellness committee, the building sunshine committee, the building crisis team, and one is, is one of our planners of her eighth grade recognition night coming up at the end of May. In addition, Mrs. Stutes also is a certified level one and level two Google educator. Mrs. Stutes values her professional development and she has participated in, in the Summer Literacy Institute at Baylor University, along with too many to reference local and regional opportunities focusing on literacy development. Mrs. Stutes and her colleagues' collaborative efforts to build a Holocaust unit has provided hundreds of students the opportunity to hear experiences of survivors of the Holocaust to gain meaningful perspectives. Within our school community, we value the caring heart tremendously. This is exactly what Mrs. Stutes has, above all. Her care for her students and colleagues is commemorable. It truly is an honor to recommend Carrie for a continuing contract with Prairie's Brick Schools. And we have Mr. Kyle Zwire. Introduced to you earlier tonight as our math counts advisor. So uh, once again, I'm privileged and honored and humbled to recommend Mr. Kyle Zwire to you for a continuing contract with Perrysburg. Mr. Zwire has been a Yellow Jacket since the beginning of the 2019-2020 of the school year, with before that serving at Toledo St. John's Jesuit High School and Academy for eight years. Mr. Zwire earned his bachelor's and master's degree from Bowling Green State University in AYA mathematics education and then curriculum and teaching. Prior to becoming a Yellow Jacket, Mr. Zwire served as the math department head for the Titans of St. John's. 
Since joining the Perrysburg team, Mr. Zwire has ingrained himself into our PJHS community. Mr. Zwire has been, has had been invalid, uh, valued in such roles, such as a building representative with the PEA, a SWAT team member, and one of our building experts in our high quality student data driven team, in which he has led professional development opportunities with our staff in student uh, assessment and, and uh, assessment literacy. Mr. Zwire spent time outside the classroom working with both students in need of enrichment and intervention. Mr. Zwire was the lead teacher in our after school support program in the spring of, 20, or of 2022, working with students to close the gap in math and returning from school from pandemic learning. This year, Mr. Zwire has become the lead advisor for our Math Counts team, which you heard about earlier tonight, had such tremendous success. In 2021, Mr. Zwire and his family began the process of becoming a host family for our school-sponsored facility dog. The Zwire family completed the training in the summer of 2022 and is now home for SALTS, the PJHS facility dog who began servicing our building in September of this past year. Mr. Zwire is the lead voice on our building facility dog team that works to ensure that SALT services are meaningful integrated into PJHS. In the classroom, Mr. Zwire holds his students to a high standard both in mathematics and developing life-carrying skills. In addition, it's the connection that Mr. Zwire makes with the students, such as participating on student dodgeball teams, which elevates him within our building. It's truly an honor to recommend Kyle for continuing contract with Perrysburg Schools. So once again, thank you, Board of Education, for the consideration of these three individuals. Like I said, um, three of PGH's finest, finest teachers that we have here, and, and just above all, just incredibly great, great, great people. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Buecher. Next, I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Best, principal at uh, Hall Prairie up. Well, thank you, excuse me, thank you for uh, the opportunity to introduce Anna Kelly and Danae Wedge um, for a continuing contract. Uh, both teachers are on the same team, so their students have a great uh, two years. So I'm gonna start with uh, Anna. Uh, Anna is a graduate of Perrysburg High School way back in 2000, and then went on to earn her Bachelor of Education from BGSU and has a Master in Special Education from there as well. Anna also uh, earned her reading endorsement and her grade four through nine licensure in math and science from Tiffin University. So prior to returning to her hometown, Anna worked in Springfield where she earned and received a continuing contract in her previous position. Since joining uh, Perrysburg back in 2015, uh, she spent two years as an intervention specialist up at the junior high and uh, the past five years, six years, I'm sorry, at Hall Prairie, she's been one of our science teachers. Uh, during the past six years, Anna has been an active participant or a leader in the following activities. Uh, our building leadership team, Jacket Way team, sixth grade camp counselor, and anybody that knows anything about camp trying to organize 400 kids off-site is a feat in itself. Uh, she's been a student teacher, mentor, and host teacher, uh, started the HPI Kindness Club, and has been one of the club's coordinators since uh, we opened. Uh, she's sat in on numerous interview committees over the last six years. She's been a member of the district CQ uh, committee. Uh, she attended the fifth grade snooze at the zoo when it was her time in the loop. Uh, collaborates closely with her peers, both uh, with Danae and the rest of her academic team and her science team. Uh, she's been a presenter at various district and BGSU events and conferences, and she's been a leader in our building and the area in whole brain uh, teaching and behavioral leadership. So one of the, the many qualities that make Anna an excellent teacher and candidate uh, tonight is her dedication to her peers and her students. Uh, her love for her students is clearly present every day in every class. So next, um, I'd like to introduce uh, Danae Wedge. Uh, she's been in the district since 2015. Uh, prior to her teaching assignment at Hall Prairie, uh, she was a reading specialist over at Woodland Elementary. 
Uh, she earned her Bachelor of Education from BGSU and a Master's Degree in Curriculum and Instruction. Uh, Danae earned a reading endorsement from BGSU as well. And during her past six years at Hall Prairie, she's been an active participant or a leader in the these activities. Uh, our advisory council, Jack at Wade team, our exact path committee, uh, social studies curriculum committee. Uh, she attended sixth grade camp and snooze at the zoo when it was her time. <laughs> There's nothing like sleeping on the floor at the, the zoo with 100 uh, fifth graders. Um, <laughs> She's been a student teacher mentor and a host teacher. Uh, she's been also part of our ELA curriculum uh, committee. She helped uh, Mrs. Davidson uh, coach our volley, uh, volley jackets, you know, similar to the junior jacket basketball program. She's sat in on many interviews. Uh, she was also part of the CQ committee. Um, just like Anna, she collaborates very closely with her team and her content area of, uh, teammates. Uh, she facilitated our homework club, and she's also been a participant in Project uh, Impact. One of the qualities that stands out uh, when, when I think of Danae is her excellent, um, dedic her dedication to uh, her craft. She's always striving to uh, become a better teacher and, and helps those around her. So it's my honor and privilege to recommend Anna and Danae for a continuing contract tonight. Thank you. Next is Mr. Cooper, principal at Fort Meigs. Good evening, everyone. Mr. Hosford, Board of Education, Mrs. Price, Mr. Dreer. Uh, congratulations to all the students, the athletes, and the uh, um, music people, the arts. Just great to see everybody. I am honored here today to stand with Mrs. Uh, Michaela Straw, who has been with the district for nine years and served in a handful of roles uh, within the district and is currently thriving uh, in her position as reading specialist at Fort Meigs Elementary School. I did get the text from her husband, Gary. Uh, they don't have their kids for that much longer, so I'm supposed to hurry. So I'm doing my best, Gary. I'm doing my best. <laughs> professionally, M uh, McKella has consistently dove into projects that professionally stretch her for the betterment of her craft, our students, and the district as a whole. Mrs. Straw has served as a kindergarten teacher, a first grade teacher, and is currently a key piece of our daily work inside of our intervention department. McKella is warm, caring, and driven to find what works for students as individuals and as a group as a whole so that they may thrive in their educational journeys. Mrs. Straw consistently wants challenges and ways to get better while ensuring that student success never wavers from being the most important element of her day. McKella has attended several professional development and training opportunities, including Orton Gillingham, PACS Good Behavior, Crisis Prevention, Oveus Bullying Prevention Program, Response to Intervention, Performance Matters, Science of Reading, and assessments as, such as Amplify and Star Renaissance. Never one to be content, McKella has recently dived into becoming a Wilson Reading Trained Professional to become a Level 1 Dyslexia Practitioner, which will aid in our building and adjusting to the current legislation involving dyslexia from the Ohio Department of Education. Most importantly, McKella has done all of this without sacrificing her daily work and focus on young people and their successes. Personally, and as per principal, McKella has become a go-to for me for insights on goals and direction of our building. Ooh, Marjorie, that's not a good idea, is something I hear a lot. McKella is a problem solver and a solutions-based professional that is valued and trusted more than she may realize. She is someone that I can count on to see the whole picture and provide honest perspectives that help decisions be made for the betterment of our building and our direction in general. She is admired, trusted, and respected in the building and is a true leader. Supporting someone like McKella is an easy task as she is a problem solver and a solutions-based professional that always puts the students of our building at the forefront of her work. So I highly recommend Mrs. McKella Straw for a continuing contract with our district. <laughs> uh, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Ms. Je Jessica Molina, principal at Toth Elementary. Thank you, Mr. Hostler, board, Mr. Dreer. 
I am recommending Mrs. Laura Short for a continuing contract today. I'm so honored to do so. Um, Laura is so committed to teaching both during the school day and after the school day. She has spent countless hours providing before school, after school tutoring. This happens even on Friday evenings after school when <laughs> everybody is ready to go home. Laura has a group of students coming into her classroom that she is tutoring with a smile on her face. So any educator knows that that takes some sincere commitment. Um, Laura is also a, a student council advisor and she has been for a few years. And as I was sitting here looking at the core values and thinking about enriching our community, Mrs. Short does that with student council. She has run so many drives, um, getting donations for Hannah Socks, for local veterans, for Ronald McDonald's house, for mom's house, and she does this with the students, and the students really get the ability to take the lead doing that. So Mrs. Short is both enriching the community within Toth and also just the larger Perrysburg community. Uh, Mrs. Short has participated, I think, on every committee that Toth has to offer, <laughs> and possibly even the district. Um, SWAT, Jacket Way, BLT, Safety Committee, um, what was that? PEA, um, Sunshine, Social Committee. So she is just um, full heartedly committed to this position and to committed uh, to Perrysburg. So I am honored to recommend her for a continuing contract. And I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Brent Schwartzmiller uh, with his uh, two recommended candidates. I, uh, I first want to thank the board for the opportunity to present um, two professionals for consideration for a continuing contract. I have Rachel Newell and Kent Vandock. Uh, it is my honor to highlight some of their work. Uh, Rachel Newell is a two-time grad of Bowling Green State University. <laughs> She's a three-time grad of Bowling Green State University. Uh, Rachel. You can correct me anytime. Um, began her career in Kentucky, uh, but quickly came to Perrysburg in her second year as an educator, as a high school math teacher at Perrysburg High School. She stayed there for nine years, um, and she has spent the last two years as a teacher on special assignment, specifically focusing in the area of math among a, a major priority for us. Um, Rachel has a natural inclination to want for better. She reflects deeply on the how and why we are doing things and steps forward to do the work to become more effective. This has led Rachel to countless work groups and leadership roles. Uh, I was going to use the term Horshack, but I thought it was too old, but Mr. Cookson used Laurel and Hardy, and I'm really current. In, in comparison, so she is our, our Horshack, always raising her hand uh, to sit on groups. Now, to put in perspective, her resume is four pages long. So I can't go through everything, otherwise we'll be here. But countless, countless district committees, um, many grant opportunities, whether it be the NWI3 or Project Impact. Um, she has sat on Ohio Department of Education work groups and committees. I counted five. Five. That's a lot. Um, so she has worked with local universities and she has held some roles with um, PEA. So she is always there. Rachel was a natural fit to assume the role of teacher on special assignment. She's an advocate for students and teachers. The education of our students is not a simple recipe. Uh, instruction is a blended mix of science or proven strategies and art, where the subtle teacher moves, aimed at inspiring, motivating, and even prompting problem solving and student ownership. Rachel thinks deeply about instruction and challenges uh, and, and challenges all of us to step up our game. Uh, this can come in conversation or more formal in, in book studies. 
Rachel is unafraid to ask the tough questions needed to pivot, or correct, uh, needed to pivot and meet the needs of our community. Uh, she does this in a manner not pointing work outward, but instead looking for ways to shoulder the work and more than do her part. In many ways, Rachel Newell is an incredible team member, ready to hold the collective group accountable, but only after holding herself accountable. So I'm gonna go to Kent and then swing back to both of them because they have some similarities. Kent um, is also a Bowling Green State University graduate. He earned a degree from the school up north, which I will not name, and then a specialist degree uh, from Bowling Green State University as well. Uh, Kent spent a year in Kaleida and 12 years in Archbold prior to starting in Perrysburg in 2018. Here in Perrysburg, Kent spent two years at Perrysburg High School as the choir director and, and teacher of vocal music. Prior, um, I'm sorry. And uh, prior to helping us offer the Perrysburg Virtual Academy in 2021. He has spent the last two years as teacher on special assignment, specifically focusing his attention on the arts and curricular review. Ken is a guy with a lot of energy, and those that know Kent are like, yeah, a lot of energy. He has, uh, he is, or has been actively involved in many activities. Um, his resume is six pages long. <laughs> so again, countless, countless district committees, grant opportunities. He's held leadership in professional organizations, such as the Ohio Music Education Association, and the Ohio Corps Directors Association. He serves as adjunct professor at Northwest State Community College and Bowling Green State University. He's, he's, prior to, um, he's done prior work in leadership with teacher unions in previous districts. He's presented several times at various professional conferences. We're talking that's a, like a whole page of his resume and just his presentation at conferences alone. Um, and he's heavily involved in resident educator and has always actively been mentoring those new to the profession. Ken is a rare professional that clearly has a side for the creative, but also relishes the opportunity to understand systems and processes. He's driven by detail, a quality that has benefited our school district as he has produced processes for, function, the, for the functioning of the Perrysburg Schools Arts Council, navigating very diverse disciplinary groups within our district, and is beginning to take on the responsibility of resident educator, for which we know the requirements are changing. Kent is an advocate for education. He has a natural ability to see multiple sides to every scenario, which helps him understand that every challenge that we face is nuanced, thereby impacting stakeholders in countless ways. Ken is gifted in navigating tough situations and coming through with solutions with the best interested of students in mind. Such a talent can't be overstated. Now I wanna say that both, I, I know that curricular review committees were, were named uh, for uh, different teachers. I will say that, that these two have their hands in multiple of those curricular review committees, but not only their hands, but they're actively creating our process of curricular review in the district. So to wrap up, I, I just like to offer the following. Um, K-12 is really, uh, K-12 education is really under a blanket of scrutiny we have maybe never experienced before. That stated, our K-12 educators again and again are meeting expectations. Our K-12 students are preparing to enter a world more complex than previous generations, but also are receiving an education better than that received of any past generation, including my own. This is due to the hard work and passion of our education professionals. Rachel Newell and Kemp Van Dock are truly two of the finest professionals I've been privileged to work with in 28 years. They, are, they have the drive, passion, energy, vision, core values, all needed to drive 
our educational field forward. They share many of these qualities, but are both individually gifted, offering greatly to our work. It is my highest recommendation that both Rachel Newell and Kemp Van Duck are approved for continuing contract. Thank you. First, I'd like to um, thank all the building leadership for just an excellent group of candidates to bring forward to recommend for consideration. Sometimes I wish if we were a little bit, if I was a little bit better at agenda management, we'd move that item up to vote on it now. We will be taking that action a little bit later on in the meeting today. Um, so again, thank you all for the kind words. Thank you everybody that's being recommended today for all the great work that you do for this district and for its students. It really makes a difference. You really make a difference. So um, I believe the next item on the agenda is a uh, five minute break. Am I correct on that? Mm -hmm. Everybody's like, yep. So we will uh, stand adjourned for a five minute break. And after that, we will come back with our first opportunity for public participation. We're gonna, I'm going to call us back into session here. So uh, there, are no pub, there are no items for public participation related to agenda items. So we will move on to the superintendent's report. Mr. Hostler. So we wanted to, again, follow up with the conversation that, that we had um, at the previous uh, board meeting, and that is regarding the facilities uh, master planning that took place. So um, with that, there's some things that I think the board, you know, had some follow-up questions, items that we wanted to um, begin, to, um, begin to, to take the conversation to really that next level. So as we begin, um, we wanted to hopefully accomplish a couple things that are discussion decision points for the board. So we're not asking the board to make any decisions today, but we're starting to take the recommendation that, that the full committee had and begin to funnel that into actionable items for, for us to continue to move forward. So hopefully as we go through today, the presentation we'll talk about you know, the board's uh, response to a couple of important uh, components to the master plan. Um, one of them is, you know, we've presented a lot of information about future growth. So what we hope to hear today is, does the board feel that that is in line with what your expectations are and, and where you think the district is going by way of, of uh, growth? The committee, as they presented um, last month, talked about two things that really drove them. One of them was identifying 2040 as a critical time that we were pointing to as a committee to, to take care of space issues, um, getting us out to that date, and then eliminating the portables as uh, an option for um, you know, classroom space long term. Uh, the scope of the recommendation from the committee, um, did, does it check all the boxes that board members have? Um, at the last uh, conversation, um, we talked about, uh, you know, two different doors, door number one, door number two. One was taking the entire recommendation and, and going through that door. Um, the other one was kind of uh, separating it into two phases. And so we wanted to hear confirmation that this is the direction that members were interested in. Uh, we've begun to talk about some different financing options. We'll have some more information regarding that and looking forward to feedback. And then one of the things that the committee wanted to do um, and presented to the board was not lose track of the cost of, of doing nothing. Um, what would happen if the district does not um, do anything? Um, there is a cost involved with that. And, and so we wanted to follow up with the board on that. Um, the Ohio uh, Facilities um, Construction Commission, we wanted to talk about, um, uh, provide an update with that. 
And then the, the levy road ahead, because we know we have some levies that are set to expire and, and the board will be making decisions about whether we, to renew or replace those, those particular levies and, and uh, moving forward. So we're gonna go through some information and hopefully have some discussions about some of these key points um, along the way. Uh, so we wanted to say again thank you to the to the many members of the community that served and staff who served on the facilities um, um, planning com committee you can see their names here and we're very fortunate that um, these folks spent over a year working together three subcommittees to come up with the recommendations that they presented last month as you know the issues that brought this committee together the issues that at the board that led to the board asking me to form this community committee uh, had to do with growth, um, had to do with aging facilities, um, uh, deferred maintenance on those aging buildings, um, trying to eliminate the disparity that's, that exists between different buildings based on the ages of those buildings, um, a growing reliance on, on portables as we move down that road, um, and then elementary boundaries that have really become kind of a patchwork of, you know, where do, where do children go to school and, and when homes are being built and neighborhoods are coming online and the challenge that we have of finding space for them. Uh, since 2002, you can see the enrollment trends uh, to 2022 and then, and then of course that projection, if we continue to grow, um, where, where that will lead us. Um, we shared with you how growth happens in Perrysburg because there's often a, a misnomer that, you know, we just have large kindergarten classes and they come through. But it's actually, as students um, move through Perrysburg schools, more and more students enroll. And, and how this chart works is in 2010, we had 302 kindergartners. Those kindergartners today will be graduating um, next month and we've gone from 302 to 429. Mm. And then you can see how each class is kind of accumulating students as they go through the district. So that is how, of course, growth is, is happening. That 2040 is a significant um, you know, number for the committee and what we hope to achieve um, in terms of planning for the future and also the elimination of, of portables, where the committee, all those names that you saw earlier said, we want to get away from, from, from doing this. So this slide represents that committee's recommendation, which you've seen, um, but this is kind of a, a summary page, so um, folks can take a quick look at it and see it. And then what we did is we did go through and, and break down what each of those recommendations would, would cost. So a new elementary, um, where we stand with, with that. Um, this would be um, upgrading and expanding the three elementary buildings, Toth, Woodland, and Fort Meigs. Uh, this is the, the Perrysburg High School um, doing what it was designed to do back when it opened, and that was to be expanded. Um, and then the junior high uh, deferred maintenance and expansion, um, and, and then HPI um, expansion and then um, multi-purpose space at uh, Perrysburg High School to accommodate the extracurriculars as that grows as well. The question came around to, to Frank and preschool, and, and um, right now, as you know, we, we do have uh, preschool in Union Elementary in Maumee, which we lease, and we're grateful for that relationship. Um, and um, it's certainly something that uh, we know that in the short term we can be there for, we have a five year lease with them, but we know long term there's a lot of conversations about bringing that back into Perrysburg and having a dedicated space in, in a Perrysburg school. So using Frank as a preschool was what was recommended you know, by the committee. The reason being, and we talked about this, that Frank um, as a site is, is the smallest site, 5.5 acres. And as you look at expanding the other buildings, there's much more property there to accommodate the expansion and also you know, the additional students and traffic that comes with that safely. Um, at Frank, expanding that, there is a challenge with space. In addition to that, um, being able to navigate uh, on that site, how to safely get, you know, several hundred more students to and from you know buses and cars and so forth so 
Other items that, that we're you know, keeping track of is uh, transportation facility expansion. Um, you know, we know that we're adding more drivers, more buses, well, hopefully more drivers, but certainly more buses. <laughs> and then Steinecker Stadium, restrooms and safety, we've talked about that, and, and here in the, this building, uh, the boiler. So all those things together um, was just over uh, $200 million. Um, when we looked at the, the last conversation, door number one, doing it all, door number two, um, you know, um, splitting it into two phases, and here's how we kind of outline those two phases. Um, with phase one, we have the new elementary, we have the deferred maintenance at the three elementaries that will be expanding under phase one, the additional classroom space and cafeteria site work at the high school, um, the deferred maintenance at the junior high, um, and then, of course, um, uh, the additions that go at the three elementary. So that would be phase one, and then phase two would, would be seen here, um, you know, with, with that. Um, so with the phase one financing, we wanted to kind of talk a little bit about that. So we used a round number of 140 million. You can see on the previous slide, 137.7 million. So we used a, a round number of 140 million. And based on some variables that, that Randy will, will talk about, um, we see that the amount of mills to, to raise uh, the funds to, to do phase one would range between 5.46 and um, 5.6 mills. So on a $200,000 home, um, that would amount to $39.84 or $40.82 increase per month. And with that, we've talked about the OFCC program, the ELP program, which um, is we, we've applied to participate in this. Um, depending on the amount of the project in phase one that would be deemed eligible by OFCC, we could receive up to 30% reimbursement. So using the round number, if we receive 30% reimbursement of the 140 million, um, we know that, that that would provide a $42,000 reimbursement. Um, 42 so million. 42 million, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and, and, and so in phase two, what that could mean is the total projects is 63 million. Um, and with that reimbursement uh, being applied back towards that, you can see how that could certainly reduce that phase two significantly. Um, um, so we don't know what the exact millage would be for that, in, in depending on the year, the amount that we would get, um, and certainly the cost to, to the home. Um, we'd be able to, to calculate that once we have a better understanding as we get closer to that. But you can see how these two projects can kind of be built, and the OFCC ELP program certainly could be a springboard to help accomplish the things the district needs in the second phase. Um, and again, just to, to, to talk about that a little bit further, um, you, you can see here that, you know, if you use a $63 million number um, with a $41 million estimate, um, we're looking at possibly a, a net of $22 million. So that's an example of how that could work with that second phase. So it is something that we did uh, apply to, to be um, to participate in, so we're waiting for feedback from OFCC about our application. Um, and, and how that works is the state has a master list of, of districts that are eligible for state funding that they can put towards their facilities. Um, Perrysburg, when this evaluation was done, was further down the list because of the conditions of our buildings weren't quite um, as bad as other uh, districts across the state of Ohio. So we're anticipating that our number will come up maybe in four to five years, depending on how the other districts between now and, and then, our number comes, how they're going to, to uh, participate. Um, so, so that is something that 30% reimbursement is something that you know, certainly the committee felt we need to consider. It's a significant um, number when you begin to look at what we hope to accomplish. So we've, we've been working with them, uh, have the application in, um, did an enrollment study, and we continue to work, you know, work uh, towards that um, uh, end. So the deferred maintenance, um, one of the things the committee uh, brought to the board is this deferred maintenance. 
Um, they looked at what it would cost in 2018 to do some of those um, things to the buildings, and you can see what those numbers were in, in 2018 dollars, and then what those are in today's dollars. So this kind of leads into that cost of doing nothing, because when we talk about these types of things, we're talking about things as they break down, like we, you know, Fort Meigs Elementary with uh, the HVAC system as the original system, um, we know that if we don't do anything to address that, at some point in time, we may be forced to address that and replace that. So where do, where do the funds come from for that? And that's something that would come out of the general fund. So, so the cost of, of doing nothing um, you know, will certainly lead to spending more funds out of the general fund, which many of the programs and things that we're celebrating tonight are paid for out of the general fund. Um, so the board will be wrestling with, you know, how to, how to manage that. And, and certainly the costs have continued to increase. Um, we cannot turn students away, um, unlike other types of schools in Ohio that, that have the ability to do that. That's something that we do not have the ability to do. So we know that in districts that are fast growing and don't have the space, um, and you know, begin to struggle with that, one option the committee looked at was, well, what would happen if? And, and sending students to school in split shifts to, to try to find a space for them is, is one option that districts have done. Um, and also is just continuing to add portables. And, and certainly that comes with a, a cost coming out of our general fund, and, and we talked about those. Um, and and um, you know the portables are, are something that we're familiar with. Uh, the construction timeline with phase one and two, you can see that if in November, if the board puts an uh, issue on in November, if it is successful, uh, you can see that work would begin immediately with um, some of the site planning and um, you know, some of the um, uh, renovations that would, that would take place along with the construction. So you can begin to see how quickly that would begin to move, especially at those um, buildings where we need that space where it becomes more critical. Um, and I apologize, this is kind of skewed a little bit here, but um, we've shared the slide before, and it is you know, that, that moving target. So when we, when we look at the timelines that we have, and it's taking us out to, to you know, 2033, and we're moving forward with those dates and trying to hit those targets, we know that our existing buildings will be getting older. And, and we know that if you know, we, we you know, by 2040, using that as a, um, as a flag, that that's where we want to reach, like the committee indicated. If we pass a bond issue in November, open up the building according to that chart, we know that that building in 2040 will be 14 years old. So, so you know, talking about planning ahead, this is what planning ahead looks like and, and beginning to do that. So the, the levy landscape, is um, you know we have uh, 20 voted mills that are retiring at the end of 2024. So what that means is what folks are paying now, um, you know, voted two mills, uh, those will be going away. So any new money issues coming on, um, you would see a, a more rapid decrease with those two mills falling off. So that certainly would help homeowners as we move through there. And then in 2042, we have 1.6 voted mills that will be retiring. And, and again, we're pointing that out because that does have an impact on the total cost with, with the um, um, residents here and, and also how you know, that works. Uh, we have two existing levies um, in 2024. We have an uh, um, operations levy that is set to expire. So the board will be deciding about renewing, replacing, or letting it expire um, as we move forward, and then a, a PI levy that expires um, in, in 2025. So um, looking at May and June of this year, if there's uh, something that the board would like to do relative to this recommendation from the committee, they would need to begin to take steps to authorize that to happen so that it could be on the ballot in, in November. So, Coming back to that first slide that we shared, um, these are kind of the talking points that um, I know we've touched upon these, but we, we were hoping today to have more of a discussion to, to go through some of these thoughts and make sure that we're continuing to move in the direction that the board wants. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hostler, and 
Thanks for the nine points here for the board to consider. I guess we'll open it up at this point for any questions, thoughts, or comments that anyone would like to start with. When will the OFCC have a decision made? Is that we've submitted all the paperwork and it's well, it, what's going to happen? Um, they're not going to have. They won't have a decision made before November. Mm -hmm. Well, they will have a decision before November. They won't have a decision made before the board has to at least put it on the ballot. Their next meeting is July. They won't be ready probably. We're trying to fast track it for July 6th, I think, not holding out hope. So uh, uh, we've discussed this with bond council, what would need to happen in June. The board would have to pass two resolutions. One, to allow us to file an exception for special needs with the OFCC so that they essentially the amount of money, that 137 to 140 million, they will um, will have approval that that's what we need for the project. At the same time, do the resolution of necessity to have the county auditor calculate the exact millage for the bond issue. And then in July, you would pass a resolution um, of um, to proceed to put it on the ballot. Between that time and November, we expect the OCC to actually act on the application and tell us what our reimbursement is. Um, our choice is to try to do that in parallel path or wait a year. So, and, and, um, and, and frankly, and I'm gonna be, the OCC kind of dropped the ball a little bit. They've had some turnover in personnel, that's why it's put us behind a little bit, but our bond council is pushing OCC really hard and there's no, there's no question that the project is needed. We just don't know exactly where they're going to fall on the, uh, on the reimbursement. So they know 30% is set. We just don't know how much of the, of the project will be reimbursable until they finish their evaluation. And then do they also tell you exactly, I know we're in a certain order, but then do they also say it's going to start in 2024, 20, 25? Like, how do you know no, that? No, no. What happens is... Um, What'll happen is, you know, what, there's a lineup of numbers. When X school district is up, they'll say, X school district, um, you're up. Do you want the project? Yes or no. If they say yes, they have a certain amount of time to get their funding. And if they don't get their funding, or they say no, they fall the bottom of the list, and they'll go through that list. And what we have seen up to this point is, because you know the schools who had 80 or 90 percent reimbursement are already done, so we're now getting into those lower. We're having, we're, I'm seeing more schools say no, they're not interested. So we don't know. We just know, you know, they're telling us four to five years. We won't know till till it comes up. That's why we're in the the ELP program that says they're going to once they commit to it, they're going to commit to that money. We just don't know when it's going to be. But we would go ahead and get it started. Well, that's where. Oh, that's okay. required. So the okay. L program says okay. you fund it, and then we'll reimburse you. And, but we don't know when we're getting reimbursed. We don't know when we're going to do okay. it. Right. Okay. Thank you for clarification. I, I've been was involved in a similar project years ago as a board member, and it was almost 10 years in between. But we ended up um, junior high, high school that did the two elementaries later that used the money, the reimbursement to, to build those two schools. So. So you'd still go through with the proposal for levy number one this fall. That the numbers we would have fixed, we would know what that would be once we decide the millage. Yeah, the 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 issue, and that's why there's like the range on the millage. It's it's a moving target, right? So it's going to be kind of the, the our um, our underwriters, the bankers, if you will, work with us and say, here's the assumptions. How many years? Because on a building, you can borrow up to forty years. Forty for the building. But the whole project is not just a building, right? There's technology, which has a certain amount of life that you're allowed to borrow against, furnishings, and so forth. So they do a weighted average and say, you can, you can finance for 37 years or whatever it is. So we have to have that piece in. And we're already working on that, by the way. So it's not anything new. So they'll tell us the length. And then, of course, once you get toward that date, you're projecting what the interest rate's going to be. Essentially, if, we, if, the, if it passes in November, we're selling bonds at this time next year. So the crystal ball on interest rates. And so that's what we have the, the experts and the bankers and stuff to help us with that. So both those are our thing. And the other thing that's gonna happen is the calculation is based on our interest rate projection 
and current total valuation in the district as of the day that we put the um, resolution together to, for necessity, right? But next year, when we sell the bonds, the valuation of the district will change. So the, the, the millage will actually change, it'll, it'll drop, but, we, but you have to do it at the point in time that you actually put it on the ballot. So all those are complicating factors, so we kind of keep that, hold that as long as we can before we say, this is what we're gonna, we can commit to. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> excuse me, as part of, so this was discussed a little bit in finance. For clarity, the vote that we are looking to do in June this two the, this two phase concept is committing us to a hundred would potentially be committing us to the 140 million phase one piece of this 201 million dollar project. There wouldn't necessarily this board would not be committing any future boards to any type of phase two project. Correct. That's the type of decision that a future board would make there once there was more clarity on that OFCC money coming back in. That's that's correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. So have we, have we made the decision that we're doing two phases? Did we already decide that? Or are we still oh. looking at the lump sum jump in? And well, we, Randy will have a better answer, but the decision may have been made for us just yeah, the way some I, of this bond capacity is this, working out. Doing the so. 200 million is not an option. We cannot borrow that, that amount. The under 140 million requires a special needs exempt, exemption at this point. Oh, okay. So, and plus, as we mentioned, one of, the OFC, one of the requirements of a bond issue, and generally you do a tax exempt bond issue, so that the, the person who's buying on your bonds are gonna get, um, is gonna be tax exempt on their earnings. That's what's attractive about them. If we, you do that, you have to, you have to um, use the proceeds within five years. Oh. So you, but if you could do a taxable bond issue, which typically is a half percent or more higher in interest rate, and then you're not under that restriction, but, and, it's, and, it's, and it gets, there's some legalese there too because you're not allowed to borrow and then make money off your borrowing. For example, right now, because the interest rates are so good, we could probably borrow and make more than it would cost us, but that's not legal. <laughs> so there's all those kind of things that you have to take into account. So I don't see in here, and I'm looking back to our special meeting, um, and unless it's in here and I missed it, the cost of doing nothing would be the cost of the portables, which would go in from would come from general fund. Well, correct. We, well, we'd, we'd probably yes, and obviously, when we say come from general fund, probably we get into situations there. First of all, the, the operating costs are not going to go away because we're still going to have growth, right? We're still going to have more students requiring more teachers. Correct. Then we're going to have to get classrooms somehow. And chances are we would probably have to do, um, we would be allowed, because it, it doesn't count against our debt, to do lease purchases. So we're probably going out to private placement and say, hey, we need to buy a couple portables, we'll pay for them over 10 years or whatever the time frame is, and that money's gotta come from somewhere, and general fund or permanent improvement. But as you can see, our permanent improvement levy is already not keeping up. Mm -hmm. So all those things are considerations. Can you remind me of what the cost of just portables, because there is a cost of doing nothing. We've talked about heavily on that the last meeting. Um, I'm trying to just find it quickly. Does anybody have that off the top it's of our 7.5 million. Yeah, 7.5 uh, million. Um, million, correct? I, I, I think that's in today. Million, that's today. On one of these PowerPoints, but they're not numbers. No, I'm trying to go yeah. through it, but I thought it was seven plus million. So there is a cost nine. to us not making a decision. Well, I mean, and again, I think as Mr. Hosser pointed out, and Tom jump in here, is we're gonna have to educate, if the, if the kids live in the district, we have to educate them by law. There's right. no, that's not debatable. Right. I guess you do, have, you do have a choice, or we have a choice, and if we don't do portables, we still have to put classrooms in that, do you, so do you do split right. sessions? Mm -hmm. oh. Like, and I know, as, for example, my, anecdotally, I went to junior high, we went from 12.30 to six o'clock. High school went from seven to 12 because we didn't have enough space for both of us. That was fun as a junior high kid not going to school till noon, but not all that practical, right? right. So. And that affects extracurriculars and other activities and family life and all of the above. 
Now, for clarification on the portables, not the portables to be purchased, but the existing portables, I know that was a big, um, a big goal of the committee. Does that mean getting completely rid of them? I just want to make sure we're on the same page, like never to come back again. Yes, that's the recommendation. Now so I then what well. do we do with the high school? Do we then, do, I mean, Brandy, do you, have you in the past, like you sell them, you? Um, so I, I, I can answer that. Um, so um, like the Woodland Portable, actually we, we um, and then there were, I think the junior high, maybe one others, we bought from other school districts. So, so we would end up selling it either back to a vendor who would sell it as a used portable um, or we would, um, you know, look at uh, selling it directly to a school district that, that had it. So, so that's what we would do. The, if you're buying, it's, 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 it's not a bad proposition because they're, you know, they lose their value after they leave the lot, so to speak. Um, so, um, you know, so we would have the ability to, to sell. The junior high ones, as we, they talked about at the, and you might recall this at the meeting, um, where the committee presented, they they would be afraid to transport those even even to another location in sure. the district because the their age and condition. So so there'd be some that we wouldn't be able to sell, um, right. some of the older ones that we've yeah. had to do maintenance to and so forth. So the newer ones, is there any way the um, they could be a temporary for the transportation? Issue? Is that something um, they could use for that for the? Thing I think then? that, yeah, that that's an interesting thought. Um, I think the um, the transportation issue I think is partially space for staff. Um, so there there could be a conversation about that. Um, I, I'm not sure because you know. I'm not sure how how going out in transportation, seeing how they operate, having another building. I'm not sure how that would work, um, but the other piece of the transportation is is having more bays to work on buses, so we can have our buses pulled in, which obviously portables wouldn't be able to to do that very yeah. well. So I just remember um, um, Courtney saying something about like not everybody could fit in her office. I was just yeah. I just know you lose money, just like yeah. you said, like a car the minute it's off the lot, and I just right. was. Okay. Yeah, and that's one of the things I think the committee really wanted to just move away from. I think oh, one of the committee I'm, members, yeah. I'm 100% for that. I just yeah. wanted to make sure that meant like we're not right. parking them here for the time being and yeah. bringing them back. But we would, we would have to use them until sure, such time the projects are done. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. understand yeah. that part. But yes. Yep. Yep. Hopefully 20, I mean 2040. Yeah. Well, they'd be you know, hopefully gone yeah, well before that. Yeah. 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 You know, looking at uh, phase one and what's going to take place has to take place. If we don't do something, right? I mean, elementary school we, isn't necessarily adding on to the high school. Right now we're over 1,700 students. Um, so I, I liked what the committee has pre presented. I like how you've got things broken down in two phases. Um, and just when it got narrowed down to obviously once you get some numbers if we get closer. But you couldn't put this uh, up in, in May, make a vote in May. You, you want to wait till June to get closer to projections or in other words I think we've got to make a decision and not keep delaying unless you're waiting for numbers to come in and if you look at the hundred and it's 14 million dollars for the portables and the cost of not doing anything as we saw earlier from 2018 to current is in, it's an increase of about eight million dollars in construction costs so as we sit and wait to make decisions the price tag is going to go up uh, I, we're for myself, I, I'm, I'm saying let's let's move on and uh, make some decisions uh, of going whenever you want that vote sooner than later. Well, the, remember the, 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 the critical item is November, right? So passing something in May does not speed that process up. I think you, so, meant, I think you meant for the board to pass a resolution right, to, right. yeah. Right. So we can that, pass, that's what that, I'm saying. That so doesn't, you, doesn't speed anything up on it except, we can, I have no problem with that. It's just um, the longer we, we wait in terms of the actual resolution, I feel like the number becomes a month better. 
Mm, okay, that's but it, that's but it may I'm not asking. be significantly better. You well, know, and the and the number you're talking about is clarity on rates and and some of the financing side of this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's. Okay. We're that's, not worried about OFCC either because that's like a Christmas gift if it happens. Well, so we we just don't. <laughs> ex their, their next time they're going to act is July, and we're like I said, we're pushing to be on their July agenda, but um, we don't know if that it, it's I was, don't know it probably won't happen. Is the conversation going to amongst the board be for the um, 140 million or 137.7 million? Which that's that's what it phase one would be. So I think we need to have a conversation about that. Like, do we? Yes. What do, What do you think about that? Where, where would you land on that question? So you're asking me what? Yeah, 137 versus 140. What? Well, I'd like to see the numbers. I mean, I don't, I don't feel like if I want to ask for what we need. If we need one, one, 137 seven, I think that's what we should ask for. We use the 140 number just as the consultants were giving us different scenarios. So, yeah. so that's why it was a round number. Um, the the dollar amount that was shared, the 137, is the, you know, is is what the committee recommended. So I get that. Yeah. There, there were three the three items that that we mentioned. You know, transportation that we just uh, talked about, um, and um, you know, the Steinecker Stadium, the safety and the restrooms there. Those things aren't included in any of those costs. So, so I think part of the consultant what they were saying is if you wanted to pick off one or two of those things, let's just round up and you know. So, um, whatever the board would moved in that direction we would definitely set a, a target saying these are the things that we would cover so just uh, this is a rough yeah. calculation we could have the the underwriters actually do a calculation the difference yeah. so assuming that that 5.6 is correct it ends up being 5.51 so that um 2.3 million is uh, is um nine ten nine one hundredths of a mil and um i did bring up in finance you know i said i thought you know, if the bathrooms need to be done at Steinecker, we really, it should be on here. So, but if you want me to vote for the 140, I want it then on here and I want to know how much it costs. I, I would agree with that if, if, I'm, if I'm hearing you right, is if we can justify the absolute necessary needs for the 140, yeah. then, then I can get on board with the 140 as well. I'm yeah. biased towards pushing what all that, all that makes sense into phase one. Me too. Rather than kicking this down the road for a future board, mm -hmm. um, with what we know today, um, I'm Ray. I'm I'm also aligned with with some of your thoughts. If we've got a pretty high confidence level of where the numbers are going to be at in May, I, I I could see myself voting for taking action in May as well. I, feedback from the community has been very positive so far. The need has been justified. The committee spent. 12, 14 months uh, putting this all together. I think they got a, a $201 million investment. I like all the components of it. Mm -hmm. You live in a resource constrained environment where you can't do all of it. So I think that the phases as they've recommended, as, as the administration has gone through it, makes sense to me as well. Well, let me, if, if you want, then I will be seeing all well, this week all of our fi financing team, and I will. Bring that question to them what they think about uh, getting the you know resolutions together if you want to go in if you want to on the may agenda we don't have to, you don't have to decide now on that just at the work session in may you can say let's put it on the may agenda or if you want both pieces on, on the may agenda or if you want to wait till the june for the resolution of necessities all those kind of things but i can i can get that ball rolling that's easy enough to if do. something happens the monday morning of the may meeting that we need to take more time and think about it in june then okay but I will, I'll get the, I'll start the, yeah, the, I, the Would you have enough time then if, if the 140 is proposed to do the, you know, like the, the estimate for the, the bathroom or, you know, the, the other things that, that 3 million would, would, um, I was, I was looking to see if James was still here. Yeah. I, I, I think he we, left. We, we, have, we have, we had the estimate. Yeah, we have bathrooms. those. We have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I thought we already well, had I know numbers. I've seen them, but I'm just saying like then. Um, you know, as we were discussing in finance, if, if that's the ask, the community wants to know where the money's going. So then that should be clearly stated in phase one is... is well, it's not here now, right? 
It's not there right now. It was the bathrooms. It was. Um, I, I, I agree. I would not be. Mm -hmm. uh, I would not be in favor of a three million dollar, two and a half million dollar other. Right. Yeah. Right. That, that's my point. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. And when I presented this, I want it this, earmarked. I want to. I want to know exactly what I'm voting on. If it yeah. is. Yeah. Yeah. And when I presented this, I said this is a round number because sure. that's what they gave us to to begin to work with the different numbers. As Randy said, there were an exercise with the different, you know, whether it be millage or or. You know, the valuation changes, you know, the interest rates, the, there were like several different scenarios as to what it could be, and that's why there's a range. So that's that's where that number was generated from, so. Right. so well, and I, again, the sooner we do something, then we have a game plan to continue to educate the community, answer their questions, um, because right now it's all, what's the board gonna do? What's the board gonna do? And information's out there. It's been, the committee's been out working over a year. It's been presented now three or four times. It's, it's, it's on the board agenda and what have you. So I think it's something where we can make a decision based upon your numbers, Randy, once you can, if you can. If, if not, I get that too. But if we can move forward, then June, uh, June 1st, we can start educating those that have questions and, and, and tell them, you know. Well, let me um, update, you know, plan on the May regular meeting, but we'll provide an update at the work session in May. And uh, we yep. should give us plenty. We have plenty of time. I mean, if you go through this thumbs up or thumbs down, we're at number nine. I mean, is there any other discussion from the board with respect to home? I shouldn't be saying, Mr. President. I see, <laughs> Eric, you should be doing Go on, this. Mr. Vice President. You're doing fine. <laughs> I'm just saying, if you go through and look, I think we're at number nine. Uh, let's, when it, if Randy can get those numbers together. So I just, I just have one question to clarify for myself, and I'm sure. Um, so these, like, phase one numbers, those are not 100% solid, obviously, but it's a good number from the um, contractors and whatever, what this would cost based on the increase, um, you know, from 18 to now, so that, you know, we're not gonna shoot ourselves in the foot later. You know, cause we, we there's estimated cost in here for increase, you know, for supplies and, you know, cause we see what's happened in the last year or two even you know, with inflation. And I just want to make sure that these numbers aren't going to be not enough, you well, know, come we, five years when we start building a new school, if that's what we choose to do, that this is, you know, based on experts and they figured out this is the number we're actually going to need. At, the, at this time, question. that 140 is our limit okay. anyway. Now, if we waited a year from now and valuations increased, we'd have, we'd have more right. okay. that we could do. But recognize no matter what number you picked, it could be 200 million. Right. It's still going to be an estimate until you hire the architect or whatever the general contractor and, it and, on you, paper. and you flesh out your scope. Okay. You're not going to have you know a quote unquote right. exact numbers. That's why you, the the collaborative built you know soft contingencies okay. contingencies in there because you do, you don't know until you get there. And every building project I've been involved in, you start off with your scope, and by the time you get to building, you're going to have to make some decisions that you may not get everything that you intended. Right. because costs have changed, mm -hmm. or maybe your needs have changed, okay. right? Because the process is along. But um, we'd have to move, you know, obviously move pretty quickly. But that, that is our, that's going to be our limit, really, right? And that's, okay. that's, think about that. That's really going to be our spending limit. You're not going to be able right. to spend any more than whatever you, the district, what the, the voters approve. Okay. You were also at, in the 63.8, 63.7, 63.8 that's up there in phase two. I believe those include projected Correct. increased costs Correct. for inflation for you, know, based on what we know today. Right. But okay. Yeah, Thank the you. numbers not today's dollars. I just am clarifying because you know that was a month ago, and yeah. there's too many numbers flying around. I just want to make sure that that's. I've had that question. And I just want to make sure that we have it. Uh, you know. Uh, I have a question answer. similar to that that somebody asked. So. If or when we start building and and something comes back and the, they say, well, you have to do it this way, but we wanted to do it that way, and the cost is going to be X, is that is that the contingencies that you say like have been built in, or is that just more increase in wood, increase in drywall? Uh, so I, I think when um, the architects were here, one of the things they, they did is they looked at the calendar, they looked at the length of the project and what the different components were for the project. So new construction versus 
renovations, and they calculated out increases for each year based on what we've been experiencing. If you recall, they had um, talked about and shared with us, we shared with the board and the community, the difference between Lake Local's project, which is just getting underway, and where those bids came in. We shared that at the last board meeting. Right. And then where a very similar school was um, that just uh, opened up brand new, and, and just in that period of time, what those were. So they took those numbers, and then they built out projections into the future. So as we get into this portion here, where they started talking about these numbers, you know, they looked at when we were scheduling those things to be done, and they built in that that inflationary cost. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing that that these numbers do reflect that. Okay. So it's it's not based on today's dollars, but then in 2028, what does it look like? The the um, the second thing is with any project that that we do, there is a um, uh, you know an estimate. Um, the best guess based on the market and the, you know, here uh, as to what those bids could be. And then you go out in a competitive mm -hmm. bidding environment and then you get, um, you know, you, you get those bids. Um, there are some parts of um, the bidding process where they, they come well under what was projected for different reasons. A company didn't get that big job that they thought in Columbus, so now they're up here in Northwest Ohio and they need to keep their guys, their crew, active and the bid came in much lower so that's money that can be put back into the project to do something else or in reverse if there isn't anyone to bid on the job or it, it came in high then you you can use money from from that environment there is contingency built in that that does afford to to pay for those kinds of things um, when bids come in too high or too low those unexpected things um, you know and those things can range from we're putting in the side the the parking lot and we thought the soil samples based on the borings that we did was going to result in us having to bring in this much extra dirt well once we started getting in it we didn't need that or so so now we've got extra funds or the opposite of that mm -hmm. um, it's a lot worse than what we thought we're going to have to bring in more it's going to cost us more that's change orders are something that we really work hard to avoid um, and certainly the experience at Hall Prairie, you know, we came in on time and under budget. So the team here has, has worked towards that and been successful in the past with that, so. Well, I guess my question more is, I know for HPI, we didn't use OFCC because we wanted to do it a certain way. So I guess my question is, what if we got into a situation where we wanted to do something that wasn't following the OFCC, but we, you know, have budgeted a certain way. Like what? Right, yeah, I understand, sorry. I think the OFCC would say, because if, if we had them riding with us at the beginning of the project, they would have a lot more input as to the code that we would have to follow. Um, what happens with this, according to my understanding, is that they would look at the project, evaluate it, and say, okay, we're gonna pay for, we're gonna reimburse for these aspects if you want to have you know, a classroom built to a specific size, you know, that that's, will cover this much, but not that. So the reimbursement of eligi eligibility would, would differ based on the aspects of those projects. So if you wanted to build a, um, a gym in the elementary that could house 1,200 students, they're saying, well, no, we're, we're, we'll pay for one for 800, so that extra, you know, it, it's on you. We know all those things okay. um, going into it. Oh, okay, that's yeah. what I want to know. Yeah. It's, it's gonna I guess up, it's like, do you front. want laminate or marble? If you want marble, right. you're going to pay more. Right, which, which we're not asking for. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking of in a house, in a house, of course. No, right. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions, discussion points? All right. We will touch base again at the May work session. We'll talk about the potential, uh, a potential May uh, vote. Okay, next item on the agenda. Thank you, Mr. Hassel. The Treasurer's Report. Well, the nice thing starting off with the uh, recognitions. You have to be uh, in a coma not to be energized by <laughs> our students and uh, staff. Um, um, I just want to comment on the continuing contracts. I 
as you know, relatively new to the district, I love the I love the process. There's some districts where that's automatic and not always deserving. I think our our staff really they've earned it. So so let's get in. I'm, I'm going to be pretty brief tonight. I want to get to um, just one other item. This is where we are to date. We're at our you know, kind of our high point on on cash. We're 129 cash days. Our tra our revenue is tracking. Um, right on the uh the only area that's kind of really off is a little bit on um our supplies is running we're good right now overall but that's um we expect that to come back capital is a little bit higher but that's a really a small amount and that's mainly due to some maintenance items uh the if you look year over year you see the benefits a, a little bit higher 13.9 percent the projections would be that be at 10 percent and um, driving that is a couple of things. It looks like our enrollment into our insurance program is higher than expected, and um, workers' comp costs are up significantly. And, and actually, something we didn't have last year, we have this year's, is unemployment. We're paying some unemployment benefits that we didn't last year. And uh, don't get me started on that one now. Hmm. It's, 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 it's one of those things that needs to be changed, but uh, we didn't have any control over it because the person was a was hired by the ESC and they didn't challenge the uh, the, the, the unemployment claim um, so and so it, it passed on to us so we're, we're tracking pretty well this month will be very very telling because we get our income last income tax statement payment and we'll get our um, our tax property tax allocation and then we'll know exactly where we are and then we'll use those numbers to roll into the, our, our May forecast um, as you can see, there's where we are cash balance wise. Um, it's a nice place to be. I wish we could stay there. Okay, so again, quickly, we're at 75% through the year. Our investments continue to be very strong. Um, tax payments are, are strong, and there's a slight millage shift from real estate to, to um, um, tangible personal property. That's one of the reasons why those numbers off a little bit. And we should end, bottom line, we should end the year better than I had in the November forecast, which is, which is always good. And I'm not going to commit to that number for at least two more weeks. So, <laughs> all right. Um, expenditures are up 5% year over year. But again, you know, we're adding staff every year, and that's the biggest driver. Um, and our supply costs are up. And we've had some, little, some more, um, it's like one-to-one -one devices. Price is really not up that much more, but the number of devices we need are that what was up there. And of course, we already talked about maintenance. And um, you know, maintenance group is doing a great job using every dollar of the PI fund they can and not hit general fund. But you, you, know, you can only get so much out of that, that nut. What I want to spend my time on is there's some information out there and about the um, reappraisal. So we're in our sextennial reappraisal for Wood County. Every six years this happens, the county auditor in theory goes around and looks at every property, looking for improvements, comparing it to the sales data, and that's, it's, 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 part, of the, it's part of that process. And, and, and I've said it publicly, and the county auditor has, we're expecting a 20% increase in the, the value, total valuations for Wood County and, of course, Perrysburg, our, our district. But you gotta be a little bit careful. That 20% is a, is a I think a really good estimate, and Matt's on board with that, but it doesn't necessarily mean it translate to a 20% increase across the board. So I wanna kinda, I've done this before, and I bear with me, I'm gonna do a little bit of uh, Levy 101 on this. So here's where we are this year. So um, we have our two bond levies, we have um, our inside general fund millage, our voted millage, and two fixed sum levies, and, we'll, and then we have the PI technology levy that comes from inside millage, and our voted permanent improvement levy. And you can see on here the full rate, um, and that was what the voted rate was at the time those levies were put on the ballot. Now the fixed sums, you don't see a rate there because the voters voted for an X amount of dollars, right? So $12 million. So that rate could be whatever was needed to collect 12 million at the time. To, and you can see then this year where the effective rates are. So they've, they've dropped, and in almost all cases, the effective rates have dropped um, 
from, the, from their voted amount, except for the inside millage, and I'll talk about that. So let's talk about the four types of millage we have here. The first one is inside millage. This one, we as a community, we have no control over. And the state constitution gave every county 10 mills of property tax to allocate as they will. The, the county commissioners divvied that up between the townships, the school districts, and the county. We, and, and Perrysburg, we get 4.8 of that 10 mills. And that's inside millage. That's a, that's a fixed millage, and we're gonna generate revenue off that fixed millage no matter what, where evaluations go. The second type of millage is, I'm gonna say, voted fixed rate millage. And these, this is subject to House Bill 920, which says that you can't generate additional dollars off that levy as valuations go up until you hit the 20 mil floor. And I'll talk a little about that. You do can get some new money from those fixed rate levies from new construction. So new construction does not count into that effective millage, but the, the valuation for inflationary purposes does. So I keep talking about inside millage. You can see this in yellow. That's the in, inside millage. That's, the, I mean, the, the millage subject to the 20 mil floor. It's the inside millage that goes to the general fund, and it's the voted um, continuing millage that um, adds up in there. So in our case, we're down at the 20 mil floor at, at this point. So when we start talking about the increase in valuation and whether it impacts the taxpayer, that's where it's going to impact on those on that um, because there's a 20 mil floor as well as well, I'll go through here. Don't get ahead of myself. Then there's the two fixed sum levies, and they're fixed total collection, um, and the effective rate is goes up or down to maintain those collections. If valuations dropped, the effective rate would go up to keep the collections the same. Okay, that's they're they're pretty simple, and the last one is the bond issues. And again, what happens is at the time that the, the, the um, bond issues are voted on, it's subject to whatever, the, whatever they're borrowing, and then the, the county auditor is gonna collect enough to make the principal and interest payments. And typically they collect a little bit more than needed in the early years, so you have a little bit of a surplus, so in the later years they can reduce the effective rate faster than the maturity. So I expect the, uh, the one at, that um, next year we should name at 2024 may come off completely earlier or, or be reduced. Okay, so this is, I don't know what happened to the last year here, but this is, since 2002, this is our, the valuation, this is the property values in Perrysburg School District, and they've gone up every year. In 2010 or 11, there was a drop, and now it's an kind of the fallout from the 2008 housing market crash. We're back up, and the last year we're missing the green public utility, so it would be up here, that's this year. And so the big jump tends to be every three years because of either um, an update or a reappraisal. The update is done by the State Department of Taxation based on sales data, and the reappraisal is done based on just that, looking at properties, and also using sales data. So. The, the, the sales, the update is done by the state, State Department of Taxation then works with the county auditor, they kind of negotiate where you end up. And then in the, this update, the reappraisal, the county auditor drives, but then we'll work with the, the, the State Department of Taxation to determine whatever that final, that number is. So this is nothing new. The big thing is this is gonna be a big jump, relatively speaking, and then we're at the 20 mil floor. Okay, so this is where we are today. And I run these um, numbers by Matt Austray, just to make sure my estimates are at least in the ballpark. So that, um, and so when we look at what's gonna happen, if the 20% ends up realized, you'll see the two bond issues, the effective rate drops, so the collection ends up being the same. And you see the same thing, you know, the, the fixed sum levies, you see significant drops in the millage, keeping the collection the same. The permanent improvement levy, the voted one, we see a, a con another significant drop to keep that collection the same. Where the district will realize a little bit more revenue is the inside millage and then on the um, current expense that's voted because we're at the 20 mil floor. Now this assumption here does not include 
the one and a half million increase on the increasing fixed sum. Okay, so I just want to compare apples to apples here. So when you add that in, that green line is the change. That's the, the additional revenue we get from the increasing fixed sum. So yes, yeah, so for, um, and these, these are numbers are before discounts and all that, but you can see what the, the impact is. So I'm not gonna downplay the significance because it is, but that's our, it's our only mechanism for additional you know, revenue at this point. And um, anyway, so that's, that's kind of that explanation. Hopefully that makes sense. So it does impact it. I can't remember what the percentage is, eight or 9% is what the, it will impact our, our bottom line on that. And that's just a school portion though, I wanna be caution. You know, we're 65, approximately maybe percentage of the total property tax, and we're the only, we're the only entity that's subject to that um, evaluation in, in terms of reducing the effect of millage. If you have a, a library issue or MRDD issue, their rates don't drop, so they get money uh, additionally, so. Any, and any, any questions on that? I thought it might be helpful to go through. Um, if, you know, at some point in time, it says you, want, you don't want to talk about levies anymore. I'm okay with that. So, <laughs> it's not the it's not the most fun conversation, right, to have. Um, last couple of things, I just want to bring you up to speed on um, five year forecast. Gave a quick preview at finance committee. I, at the work session, we'll go through in detail. Like I said, I, I'm thinking we're going we're to end up this year better than we expected. Um, we've already talked about the facilities projects financing and appropriate, there's an appropriations update on the books and that's just you know, adjusting some grant stuff and some things here and there. Uh, we may have one more final, we'll have to do a final appropri appropriation in June to wrap the year up. With that, anything else? I just wanna say one thing that was brought up at the finance meeting. The 20% is a um, average of what they think. However, depending on where you live, it could be more. Or, or less. Or less. Yes, you're, you're exactly right. It's an average, so. It's an average. You're, you know, if you have a, if your property, if your house's roof fell in, you're probably not gonna see a 20% increase. Right. Right. Or if you're in a neighborhood where, you know, houses are selling 50% higher than they did, you might you see, see a you might increase. see a higher. Yeah, it's exactly right. Okay. right. Any other questions? Our award-winning treasure, Randy Druyer. Thank yeah, you, sir. There you go. <laughs> so the next item, or the next uh, item on the agenda, is to seven three seven two seven three. Are we doing this all in one vote? If you would, please. Okay. I mean, yeah, I see it there. I'm sorry. Seven so, uh, recommended action to approve the treasure agenda's item seven point two to seven point four. Can I have a motion? So moved. Ms. Larimer? Second. Dr. Ruffert? And roll call, please. Ms. Larimer? Yes. Dr. Ruffert? Yes. Mr. Pullman? Yes. Mrs. Eubank? Yes. Mr. Bennington? Yes. Motion carries. Next item on the agenda are committee reports. Uh, it's a busy week for committees. We'll start uh, Ms. Larimer with the operations committee. Um, James put out a, a nice review for you there, though I noticed that he Kind of, kind of left with something off there on the transportation because he talks about that we're going to be four drivers are retiring. The bad news is that that will put us 10 down. 10 down. So that's kind of an important number to notice on, on that one. Um, but the talking about food service was fascinating because she was, um, Denise was explaining how She's changing the menus and doing different things over at the high school, and it's just generating all sorts of excitement over there. So that's that's kind of a neat thing to kind of keep a watch on. Um, but I don't remember him saying anything about the next meeting is going to be at the high school. Is, did you hear that, Eric? Because it says that under technology that we're gonna be at the high school so that we can see the uh, anatomage table. That would be cool. Yeah. So, okay, all well, right. Well, we'll meet you at the high school. Yeah. Yes, I, yes, I, and I'm gonna shove you out of the way because I wanna do that. Yeah, <laughs> cool. I, uh, I thank you very much. Okay. 
I probably also, you know, I, I was also uh, Denise in food services talking about the grant money that she continues to go after. She, oh my she, gosh, she had to be prompted. Genius. Yeah, I had to be prompted to tell us about a twenty thousand dollar, I guess eighteen thousand dollar grant, and a couple of minutes later she tells us about a hundred and twenty nine thousand dollar grant she got. And well, let's keep her talking because by the time the meeting's <laughs> over, it will be up to five hundred thousand. But no, it's really doing a great job finding uh, sources of revenue also and taking advantage of uh, different grants where we can. Next item, uh, uh, next uh, finance committee. I don't know that there's anything more to say. but And then curriculum committee, Mr. Pullman. Yeah, just a couple of things. You see the notes again there before you, but uh, we really spent a lot of time, Mr. Schwartzmiller, Eric and I, and Joe Sarns, Mr. Hostler, on the high quality student data and how teachers were using that in uh, OTES 2.0 with respect to evaluations and just a really good conversation. But if you get time, some next couple of days or weeks, if you, I'd like to show you um, individually or if you'd like to see it, I can send it to you, or Mr. Schwartzler can, just what the educators have to go through to come up with information, like giving a true false test, multiple choice test, essay, what they're doing to come up with questions that are valid and also how they're being evaluated and what they're being evaluated on. The, uh, the data is being used wisely. And it's just, uh, the teachers today, the ones going to get their, well, if we have to vote on it yet, the continuing contracts, is, I'm continuing to be impressed by what they have to go through um, because they need to educate our kids and get them up to speed to being one of the best schools in the area. And they are doing a great job of that, both educators and the students. So anyway, it's, it's important stuff. Uh, you can see the rest of the information there that we kind of reviewed. I told Mr. Schwartzmiller that uh, uh, they're like, again, the, the heartbeat of the curriculum. And when you go to Disney, they have an underground uh, passage that all the storage, all the things are going on to make it happen. And I think Mr. Schwartzmiller, Miller and his group uh, curriculum, they do a fantastic job keeping us up to speed in our standards. And again, continue to be impressed with what he does and what the staff does. Ray, is there an update on the equity audit and, and that report? I have not had an update yet. You haven't been presented it at all? Mm -hmm. The high quality student data? Somewhere? Yeah, the equity that audit, report? yeah. We're supposed, I think, I remember when we signed the contract, it was it was going to be presented, and there was going to be a PowerPoint, and I thought they were going to come and. We have a call scheduled with them, uh, and, Pardon me. and we have a call scheduled with the folks that were conducting it. So, we'll have more information, you know, after that call in terms of presenting and when when things will be, you know, shared with the community. So. So everything's done though. Like they've done their. I, th I think so. They've collected, they had their, um, it's been a while, I think they had their last, um, uh, they were doing the, um, I can't think of the name, the, the um, groups, the small groups, the focus groups. I think this fall. Yeah, so um, I know they're, again, we have that call scheduled where the, I'm sure they'll set up some timelines for presentations, so. Yeah, I recall the timeline being sometime in the spring, so we're not. Too far off of, of what that discussion was. So yeah, hard to believe. Is it spring? I don't know. A month left. Any other? Thank you. Any other? Any other uh, committees or points to be raised in this section? Okay, then we'll move on to the consent agenda. Uh, consent agenda will cover items 10 through 14. I will take a motion to accept. So moved. Mr. Pullman. Second. Dr. Refford, and roll call, please. Mr. Pullman? Yes. Dr. Refford? Yes. Mrs. Eubank? Yes. Ms. Larimer? Yes. Mr. Bennington? Yes. Consent agenda passes. Next item, uh, other items for consideration, non-consent agenda, are certified continuing contracts, what I assume a lot of people are still here to see. So I will take a motion to uh, accept that agenda item. So moved. Dr. Reffert? Second. Mr. Pullman? And roll call, please. Dr. Reffert? Yes. Mr. Pullman? Yes. Mrs. Eubank? Yes. Ms. Larimer? Yes. Mr. Bennington? Yes. Motion passes, and congratulations to all on that. Yes, yes. absolutely. Thank you. Item 16, board discussion. Any new business that the board would like to raise? 
Um, I just wanted to point out, in case you didn't see it in your email, I think it went out today, so it's, it's a little late, uh, we apologize, but the um, Harrisburg School Foundation uh, Honors Banquet is going to be on Wednesday, May 10th, um, start, um, cocktails and things starting at 5.30 to 8 o'clock, it's at Belmont, uh, if you could put get that on your calendar and get your reservation in. If you haven't been to one of these, they're absolutely phenomenal. Um, it's kind of like what we had tonight on steroids. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's really, really neat to see. We apologize for the lateness. There were troubles in getting it, but it's done. It's ready to go. Be there or be square, because it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Just one comment I should have mentioned earlier, 14.1, about the uh, student handbook. What a great piece of uh, documentation to put it all together like that, Mr. That Osler. was awesome, yes. A nice job. A lot of work for that, too. Okay, next agenda item is public participation on topics other than non-agenda items. The board welcomes public participation and limits uh, individual speakers to three minutes with a total of 15 minutes. The board will not respond to comments. However, I may respond subsequent to the meeting. Um, once I recognize you, please come forward, state your uh, name, address, and affiliation with the district. Uh, first speaker is Mr. Aaron Hutton. Good evening, my name is Aaron Hutton and I reside at, on White Road in Perrysburg, Ohio. I currently have two children in the district. I wanna begin by stating that I spoke at the last board meeting and addressed the board asking for action regarding my 10 year old child who has been bullied, harassed and tormented by Perrysburg school staff. It has been a month and not one board member has even reached out to me or my family. This is disheartening and shameful, not to mention this goes against everything outlined in the board's policy 0118. After having discussions with the Ohio Department of Education, it was noted that Ohio is a local control state in education, which means you, the Perrysburg Board of Education, are obligated to establish policies and procedures in accordance with Ohio school law and implement these policies and procedures that have been violated. Your staff and administration are in direct violation of Ohio Revised Code Section 3301, Conduct Unbecoming Aggravation and Mitigating Factors, as well as Ohio Revised Code Section 3319, Reporting of Improper Conduct Investigation Kept in Personnel File and numerous other policies. It is evident that you have not done your due diligence to date and it has been documented on the Ohio Department of Educators conduct and disciplinary page that either staff Lisa Watson or Janice Protzman have received any disciplinary action. However, in several emails from Tom Hostler and Principal Michael Salowitz, it was noted disciplinary actions were taken. I have done several public records requests where pertinent information has been withheld. I have been verbally attacked, lied to, and harassed by the administration. I am here to tell you that your silencing tactics will not work on me or my family. You will not bully me, my family, or my child into silence. Tom Hostler's slandering remarks will not be tolerated. Your threats to call the police if I show up at central office is ridiculous. Your attempts to take away my right to come to the school is absurd. All these actions are just a tactic to try and keep me quiet. I will not be silenced. The parents of the students that are under your care need to know what is going on in the district. You have an obligation to protect the students of this district, my child included. I have been asking for your help in this matter for months to no avail. In fact, you, the Board of Education, hasn't responded at all. I'm imploring you to take immediate action. Stop trying to cover your tracks and look at the situation your staff has caused and let's work towards a resolution. We have made it abundantly clear that we are open and available to meet with any or all of you to establish a resolution. You need to take action. The board recognizes Mr. Griffith.
And Mr. Griffiths, uh, state your name, address, affiliation with the district, and you'll have three minutes. I'll be glad to, neighbor Bennington. Good afternoon. <laughs> Drew Griffith, uh, Tunbridge Court. I'm an attorney. I'm licensed in Ohio. I had hoped to not feel compelled to make statements to the board tonight, but the previous speaker mentioned my current client by name, and that, I feel, needs to be responded to in a public forum. I want to put context and full disclosure on the situation regarding the recess monitor at Woodland School. I am here to tell you, board members, that your staff, your teachers, your support folks at Woodland School have made extra effort, customized efforts, and have gone above and beyond the call of duty to accommodate this particular student. Those um, accommodations um, are more than were met for any other student, and they were based upon the specific request of these parents and the school board, and your staff has responded, and they've acted professionally. There's a protection order which was issued. It is important that you know in a public forum how that happened. It was through what's called an ex parte hearing. That means one side presents evidence on that case. Um, in a instance of extreme caution, yes, the protection order was issued in an ex parte fashion. There was supposed to be a full hearing approximately 10 days later at the request of the complaining party, the petitioners. That was kicked out about 30 days to April 11th. On April 10, I received uh, communication from the petitioner's uh, attorney, uh, and he indicated that that uh, missed the following day, April 11th, voluntarily by the petitioners, and that is exactly what happened. There had been a previous accommodation for this student, which was to have the recess monitor work indoors at the as a cafeteria monitor to avoid contact with this particular student. Uh, during the recess period, that accommodation was the only settlement factor or concession made to the petitioner, otherwise we're going forward to the hearing. So we said, we'll keep the recess monitor in on cafeteria duty during this particular student's recess period, thus there should be no contact. That accommodation was made before the protection order was sought, and when the day for the full hearing came, it was voluntarily dismissed by the petitioners with no further concessions. Incomplete public recitations of perceived wrongs done to one's children do nothing to solve those issues. They merely feed social media echo chambers inaccurate fodder for public gossip. When the full evidence was to be presented on April 11th, the petitioners dismissed the protection order against your recess monitor. No concessions to the petitioner were made other than continuing the earlier accommodation. You as a board deserve to hear these facts in a public forum. I'm here to support the efforts of your professionals. Thank you. Out of order, and with that, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Ms. Larimer, Dr. Reffert, roll call, please. Ms. Larimer. Yes. Dr. Reffert. Yes. Mr. Pullman. Yes. Mrs. Eubank. Yes. Mr. Bennington. Yes. We are adjourned. <laughs>